My name is Rabbi Leonard Blank, though many also call me Rabbi Yehuda Blank. I am the director of the Chaplaincy Commission and External Affairs for the Rabbinical Alliance of America. On behalf of the Rabbinical Alliance of America, Igud HaRabbanim, the National Council of Young Israel, and Lenox Hill Hospital, I want to welcome you to this premier symposium, Mechayel L'chayel, Living a Healthier Life, Physically, Mentally, and Spiritually, being held May 28, 2019, Chav Gimel Ir, Tavshin Ayin at Lenox Hill, one of the most renowned hospitals in the United States. We are truly honored to have in the audience many distinguished rabbis, chaplains, and other professionals. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Rabbi Simcha Silverman, the Director of Chaplaincy Services of Lenox Hill Hospital, who is also the Rabbi of Congregation Eitz Chaim of Flappish. Rabbi Silverman. Good evening and thank you. Welcome. I echo Reverend Blank's words and welcome you all to Lenox Hill Hospital and I thank you all for coming and participating in tonight's beautiful symposium. Our sages speak of the virtues of a good neighbor. I've been blessed with a good neighbor, Katie Greer, project manager for hospital administration. <laughs> this idea of a symposium came to my desk a couple of months ago. I brought the idea to Katie and the result is this beautiful event that we have tonight. Please join me in expressing my appreciation. How beautiful and appropriate that Lenox Hill Hospital is hosting this symposium, a joint symposium of two wonderful rabbinic organizations, Rabbinical Alliance of America and the National Council of Young Israel, coming together to this evening. How beautiful it is that a hospital that caters so wonderfully to the needs of the Jewish community is able to host the rabbis representing so many communities. Let me take a moment and give you a walkthrough of what it means to cater to, accommodate, meet the needs of the Jewish community. You start from the lobby, and perhaps you notice when you walk in, if you came in through the main lobby, that there's a sign that's there or it goes up closer towards the end of the week, that if you're Sabbath observant, notify security, because we have provisions beginning in the main lobby for Sabbath observers. There's kosher catered food for our patients, and in fact, the person who's catering tonight's dinner refreshments is the same caterer that provides the kosher food for our patients. We're not serving you hospital food, we're serving our patients catered food. There's a, a Sabbath elevator, in effect from Friday 4 p.m. through Saturday 8 p.m. to help people get up and down. There's a bigger colon room that's really an oasis for so many people that come in inpatients or appointments. And we're happy to have the founder of the bigger colon room, Mr. Mendy Greenberger, here with us this evening. There are Shabbos apartments for those that need to stay by the hospital and accommodations made for the Sabbath. There's Abraham Steinberg, who many of us know. If you don't yet know, we'll make sure you know. But most of those things that I just mentioned are reasons why a person would pick a hotel or a place to vacation, not necessarily a hospital. What's more important is the sensitivity to the needs and the desires of medical care according to Jewish law and tradition. And that's something where Lenox Hill is a premier institution in making sure that the needs of the patients and their families' requests are tailor-made and custom to Jewish law and tradition when the need calls for it. It's not uncommon to be sitting in a meeting in this hospital and to hear the names or rabbi, names of rabbis or organizations of people sitting in this room right now being mentioned as part of the care plan for the patient. Where a doctor may mention that they spoke to a rabbi representing an organization that can help guide Jewish law and tradition when it comes to medical decisions. That doesn't happen by itself. It comes because there's an administration in this hospital that supports the needs, the cultural needs, the specific needs of each community that we cater to. We're honored tonight to be joined by a member of that administration, Mr. Joe Leggio. <laughs> Mr. Leggio is a driving force behind care that's culturally sensitive, culturally tailored, behind community relationships, behind building community, behind being a wellness partner with the communities that we offer and serve. And tonight it's an honor to have Mr. Joe Leggio with us, to be with us at this event. So thank you, Mr. Leggio. <laughs> The doctors that are participating they express our great appreciation, Dr. Mendel, his enthusiasm for this event, his wisdom, his knowledge, and his area of expertise. 
The other physicians that will be here later as their presentations come up with excellent, wonderful physicians and the opportunity to engage with them tonight. I know Dr. Mendel wants to look at it more as a conversation than a, than a presentation, and we thank him for his engagement and commitment to tonight's event, so thank you. Again, it's my honor to welcome you to Lenox Hill Hospital, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Now please join me in welcoming Mr. Joe Leggio for Executive Warrant Remarks. My name is Joe Leggio. As Simka said, I'm one of the Associate Executive Directors here. These are some of my favorite um, moments that we have. Um, when we get to connect, when we get to talk to people of this community, of surrounding communities, of neighboring communities, and we get, we get to take care of one another. And that's what this hospital does. The hospital is a place where we take care of people. And I kind of think of this room as a room full of caretakers of your community, of your families, of your friends, of, of your spaces. And so how important that we care for you. So we, um, we're, we're honored to have everyone here today. We're excited uh, this evening. I know um, all the speakers where we are in for good conversations, uh, some good advice, some good questions. Um, but again, we're, we're really honored to, to have this, to have you here. As you can see, there's so many events that happen in this space. Um, the hospital's meant for the community. It's meant for us, it's meant for the people, and that's exactly uh, why we're here today. So, And I just need to recognize our, our Rabbi, Rabbi Simka Silverman. He is incredible. And everything he does, uh, it's his ideas, it's his creation, it's his passion. I've just got to move a few people out of the way or get them to say yes or say no, depending on what we need. Um, and it's him, so uh, I just needed to make sure we recognize all the work that he does. So so with that, I look forward to our, our agenda tonight. and and. We're here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Silverman. I'm going to be brief. I want to first by Postman for Achsanya, Rabbi Silverman, Lenin Hill Hospital. We thank you for opening this wonderful institution for this important gathering this evening. I remember a few months ago back, I had a conversation with our dear friend, our Chavra, Rabbi Hammer. And the question came, who, are, who is caring for rabbis? And biblically we know, novelty bowl. But Yisrael told Moshe Rabbeinu, if you're going to have a 24-hour non-stop job, and not delegating or having any help, how are you going to survive physically, mentally, in body, soul, and mind? So it's a biblical ob obligation, when they arise it from the Torah, especially for Rabbanu, based upon the conversation with Yisro and with Moshe Rabbeinu. As a result, we have this program here this evening. And I'm confident that Rabbi Blank, the Chaplaincy Commission, consisting of Rabbi Blank, Rabbi Krieger, Rabbi Ivry, Rabbi Silverman, and Rabbi Chazan, in collaboration with Rabbi Hammer. Rabbi Volk, I'm very happy with the amount of work we put into this and how hard Rabbi Hammer worked on this and hopefully tonight this will be an important lesson. I'll conclude with one thing. Rabbanim worked 354 and a half days, depending how you count the lunar calendar, or the Mispereim 365 days a year. But clucked up the tear, he could knock on the door by his Pesach Seder. You could interrupt the Yom Kippur, Chas Shalom, something happened. There's no such thing as vacation for the rabbinate. A rabbi, no matter where he goes, is constantly on patrol, constantly ministering for the people. And if you cannot minister to yourself, you cannot say this quiet time, I'm shutting the cell phone. Of course there will be a crisis, people can't find me. By Balabatu, when the rabbi goes on the bema, he has to smile. When he talks to the children in the Talmud Torah, the Hebrew school, he has to smile. When he meets politicians, he definitely has to smile. When he interacts with the old and the young, he has to smile. But the world is never forgiving. By a rabbi, you look with a fine lens to cap him, to catch him on something. So not only must you be a presenting doll 24-7, 365 days a year, you gentlemen are in cotton scrutiny. So tonight's program, not only the mental health, not to be burnt out to spiritual care as Rabbanim is also meant to help you under the extra stress of what Rabbanim go through because of Balabatim. So with that, I thank Rabbi Silverman, I thank the committee, I thank the National Council of Young Israel, 
and with hopefully by the time this evening is over, Rabbi Blank, the feedback will be, will be Mitsu Yam Bakom. Thank you, good evening, welcome. A beautiful partnership, the two organizations to get together, the Rabbinical Alliance together with National Council. And it's our opportunity to call upon Rabbi Yaman Hammer, Director of Rabbinics, the Young National Council of Young Israel, a mentor to so many, a teacher to many, Rabbi Hammer. I will be so brief, you won't even see me on the video. <laughs> However, I, I, I cannot thank everyone here enough. On behalf of my partner in crime, Rabbi Mark Volk, who is our Executive Director of the National Council of Young Israel. Uh, the fun we had preparing this event, I uh, really, Rabbi Blank and Rabbi Marachnik and of course Rabbi Silverman and the professionals at the uh, at Lenox Hill Hospital, I have to really give a shout out to Rabbi Student. The, the history of this is that we were having this kind of conversation about what we could do and we came up with like a thousand ideas of how we're going to do different kinds of programming and then we pinned it down to this and then my student said to me, okay, we can do this, but I, I really, I, I have a very, I'm very, very busy, so I'm going to hand it over to another very talented young man, and that is Rabbi Blank, and from there, the rest is history. So I really want to thank my student for inspiring us to get to where we are at this particular moment. I just, with my conclusion to this entire thing, is that it, it, it's a miracle to be able to find Rabbi who can take off any time for anything. And so, let's take advantage of what we're going to hear tonight. Let's really listen. Let's put those phones away. Except, of course, you know if you have an emergency. But let's put the phones away, unless, of course, you know your spouse is calling you. Let's put the phones away unless you know your children are calling you. So it's almost impossible to shut it down. Our lives are just always full of this kind of everything. But I can tell you, I've also had an experience being a Rav in a hospital community in Long Island Jewish, where the young Israel of New Hyde Park is. <laughs> and all I could say about that experience and the experience that my family had, particularly my children, who on Friday night, we walked through the hospital to see who was there and to bring them what to eat and to give them some sort of Shabbos or Yontif or just some Chizuk that we possibly could do. You're all in a field that you put your heart before everything else. Tonight, I ask you to understand that all we want of you is to be able to, you have the strength to be able to do this to 120 years. Let's learn something tonight. Let's really listen and thank the presenters for giving it their all to be able to let us go back to the vocation that we've chosen with love and with sensitivity to do what we could do best. So, Daraba, Shashakov to everybody. Good evening. My name is Rabbi Michal Khazan, and I'm a member of the Rabbinical Alliance of America Chaplaincy Commission. I'm also a graduate from the Young Israel National Council Advanced Rabbinics course, which Rabbi Hammer helped me tremendously. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Mendel, who's a neurologist at Lenox and Hall. Good evening. Um, so let me tell you a little story and maybe we'll have a little conversation. So about a month ago, there was a patient here in the hospital, an African-American woman, who was admitted with cancer. And she was very despondent. And she read the Bible and felt as though maybe there's no hope. And she would cry each morning thinking whether she was going to live or whether she was going to die. And she said she was a very religious person and wasn't sure whether she still believed, even though she read the Bible every day. So what did I do? I called in Abe Steinberg. And Abe Steinberg went to see her every day she was in the hospital. And five days later, when she left and responded to her chemotherapy, she said to me, he gave me resilience, he gave me hope, I now can face my family with courage, and thank you for sending me my goodbye. So that's what we do at Lenox Hill. So you know, there are a lot of things. We're gonna go over this, but the little saying which you know better than me, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? So uh, a rabbi came to see me about a week ago. He came to see me with migraine. He had hypertension, diabetes, overweight. He was a non-smoker. 
he didn't exercise and didn't take a vacation in many years. He told me he didn't miss a sermon for 15 years on any Shabbos. I took time to listen and he said to me he was feeling overwhelmed. Why? Because he said, everybody is seeking my advice. They want me to comfort them on divorce, mental health challenges, family members, conflicts, financial instability, substance abuse, domestic violence, and housing concerns. The rabbi said, I feel stressed. I feel all these problems but I don't feel I have the expertise to handle it. We ruled out any medical causes, and we sat down for a long time and talked them about life-changing strategies. We told him that he should sleep better, better nutrition, plan vacations with his family, exercise, support from his colleagues, um, get support from Jewish services. And he called me um, over the weekend and he told me, I feel like I'm renewed. I feel I can now do what I can, but I'm going on a sabbatical for three months. So um, uh, over the past couple of weeks, I, when I spoke to Rabbi Silverman and the group, they suggested um, uh, that I suggested to them I can tell them about stroke and brain tumors and all the fabulous programs we have. We have epilepsy programs, movement disorder programs, stroke programs, dementia programs. We have all the programs here. And Rabbi Silverman says, no, we want to hear a little about self-care. We want to hear, so what did I do? Not knowing a little much about self-care, uh, decided I was going to make calls. So I called up the director of Chabad. I spoke to the Lubavitch rabbi. I talked to uh, an iman. I talked to a priest. And they all had the same feeling. They said to me, we have the following principles. None, one, number one, we need to watch over our own body. I need, as the rabbi said, cut off my cell phone at night. Number two, I can only take care of you if I could take care of myself. Every therapist and every rabbi needs a therapist. It's okay to say, I don't know, and we're all human. And ask the experts. There's a stigma that we want to erase because we're all human, we all have families, and we all have stresses in our lives, and we'll talk a little about today how we could reduce those stresses. Just apropos, within the past seven days, the World Health Organization has adopted guidelines for a healthy lifestyle to reduce dementia. And we're going to go over each of those guidelines. If we talk about drugs that we can take for dementia, none of them work. There are multiple trials of various drugs, but to date 95% of all those drugs have been ineffective. What can we do? The questions are, uh, last week I went to a uh, conference at the um, uh, Spanish-Portuguese synagogue on depression and suicide among the Jewish population. People raised their hands and said, I went to a psychiatrist, I went to a psychologist. Um, they all told me that my son was okay. So then I went to another psychologist, and the following week he jumped out of the window. So the answer is, so what could we do? Sometimes we can't prevent these things, but you here can provide comfort and support so these families could survive, reduce the stigma. When people have illnesses, it's not their own individual illness, it's a family illness. It's many times it's a brain disease, whether it's mental illness, whether it's a heart disease, it's still a family disease that the families have to cope. So let's look at some of the things that we have here. Next, I'll go next, I'll do this, okay? So neurons have the ability to function and survive depending upon a couple of things. The reactions that take place to cause that support survival, but also has to function for repair, remodeling and re regeneration. So if you remember, people, Kathy Gifford uh, and um, other people who were shot in the head, um, they were felt they can't speak anymore but the brain has some plasticity. And therefore, whether it's plasticity for the body, it's also plasticity for the mind and spirit. Neurons that constantly have to maintain and repair themselves. Okay? So how do we eat well? What do we do? What do we do? So even if you're healthy, there are changes in memory. And with age, 
We're multitasking. We have difficulty finding words. We have some uh, reduced ability to pay attention. But we can still improve our skills. We can learn new things. We can create new memories, improve our vocabulary. And each one of us, the question is, when do we seek help? When is it where in our lives that is something that's a little different? Are we saying there's different or families? So most families who come to see me do not feel they have any problem at all. It's their caregivers that feel they have a problem and their caregivers are the ones who are frequently suffering. Okay. How do we protect ourselves? We're going to talk about a little about healthy eating, Mediterranean diet, regular exercise, keep your brain active, have social connections and get enough sleep. And clearly not enough sleep or too much sleep has been shown to increase the probability of dementia. Okay. Healthy eating, good nutrition, so eating less sugar, salt, solid fat, and it's not when you're 70 years old, but when you're 30 years old, or when you're 40 years old, because once you develop a problem earlier in life, it's going to lead to a problem later on, and it's something that you may not be able to control. You should get uh, regular medical checkups and you should follow a diet. There are various diets that people have used um, that the nutritionist who will speak with you, and they may be helpful. They may be helpful. They may be helpful to reduce your cholesterol. They may be helpful to reduce obesity. Reducing obesity will lead to better cognition. There are some, many patients that I've seen um, who have had gastric bypass surgery, and following the gastric bypass surgery, they felt their thinking better. Whether long-term it will be of benefit, unclear. But these are patients that I see on a regular basis who are markedly obese. Only 20% uh, after two years have even maintained a loss of weight. Exercise. So I have something which I actually I found from Rabbi Hillel the Elder. Some students talk to Rabbi Hillel, and when he took his students for a walk with them, the students ask the rabbi, why are you walking? He says, to do a mitzvah. What's a mitzvah? To take a bath in the, in the clubhouse. He said, Rabbi, he describes the importance of physical body. His logic, he said, extends not only to mental, but emotional health. Um, he said, I'm trying to pursue practices that don't drain me and restore my body and mind. Balancing work and literature and, and lifestyle. Demonstrating the power of disengaging, taking time off. So, healthy lifestyle. Take a walk. Take a break during the day. Help prevent falls. Falls are a major issue. People who fall down and get hurt especially when they may have strokes or other diseases, have a much higher morbidity and mortality. Okay? Keeping your mind active, reading books and magazines and taking a class. One rabbi told me that he learned a new language. He learned Chinese. Why did he learn Chinese? Because he felt he wanted to do something new. And he plays video games. He says, I don't tell anybody that I play video games, but I play video games because it keeps my body much more active. And I play video games every night, and I play it with my children. And I'm there with my children, and my wife looks at me and says, Rabbi, what are you doing? And he says, I'm talking and I'm playing with my children every night. So let me just stop for a moment and ask thoughts, comments. Yes? At the previous slide, when you discuss exercise, Yes. So are you talking about intense exercise or just physical activity like walking, taking a long walk? I think the way I look at it, I tell my patients there's chicken and there's humans. This is what I explain to them. Chicken, there's dark meat and there's light meat. In humans, it's all like a checkerboard. So if you're running and doing aerobic activity, that may not be good enough because you need to do some resistance. Not to say you need to go to the gym, but you need to exercise your entire body. Uh, we did a study uh, that looked at people who were uh, kidney transplant people, and we exercised them for five days and wanted to look at their hemoglobin A1C, and it didn't change. Then we had them do weights two days a week. It didn't change. And now we combined two days here and two days there, and they had a dramatic drop. So it's a combination of both, 
and what you feel comfortable to do, obviously with your physician sort of guiding you um, and not sort of going to the gym where we'll get hurt if we go the first time. But at the same time, it's a matter of developing a program for your body and therefore makes you stronger. When I go to the gym and my wife goes to the gym, we feel cognitively, we feel stronger for the rest of the day. We may fall asleep early, but we feel stronger for the rest of the day. Comments, yes. So people who take part in meaningful activities, so it reduces their risk. Uh, volunteer. Um, we're going to go with your community in the soup kitchen. Physical stress, accidents, alcohol, alcohol in moderation, smoking, um, some medications which you may be medically required to take may in fact reduce your cognitive ability. Um, so what are risk factors? Accidents. You want to improve your balance, and that's one of the advantages of exercise. If you fall, you get a, uh, you'll be less hurt. Review medicines with your healthcare provider. People take medicines to help go to sleep, and they fall down and they get hurt. Alcohol impairs communication. It causes drowsiness, reduced balance, um, can cause liver problems and other serious medical problems. Smoking. Um, smoking, quit benefits of smoking, uh, lower risk of heart disease, um, consider limits to your exposure to air pollution, uh, have safe environment. Medicines can affect your ability with your brain. Look at over the prescription medicines and look at drug interactions, whether medicines can affect sleep or not. There are several health conditions that affect your brain, which we'll hear about heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes, and sleep problems. Heart disease, you want to manage your cholesterol, your blood pressure, eat healthy, quit smoking, alcohol, and limit uh, air pollution. Diabetes, diabetes will increase your probability of stroke, will reduce your memory, um, will, uh, in essence, cause more uh, damage to your brain that might then lead to Alzheimer-type symptomatology. Um, maintain a healthy diet. Sleep-related difficulties. It's felt that people who go into surgery, almost 20% who are obese, may have some evidence of sleep apnea, and therefore screening ahead of time may reduce the morbidity or hospitalization. Okay? Dementia. Uh, some people, we just can't prevent it. But what can we do and how, what is the approach? Exercise, diet, <coughs> blood pressure, and cognitive brain training. So where to start? Uh, get a physical exam. Review your medicine, uh, look at the vegetables, look at the foods, and be involved in your community. So what's executive function? What are we talking about with memory? It's engage in independent, <coughs> appropriate, self-serving behaviors for four types. There's four types of memory. One is episodic, where you went to school. Semantic, knowledge-based, who's the president. Procedural, what are everyday tests, a working memory, short-term memory for processing, driving a car. So some people, most people who come to see me with memory problems don't have memory problems, but they come with issues related to personality changes, that, uh, that they're angry, that they have reduced temp uh, temper. Okay? Dementia is a decline in functioning. It could be physical, mental, social, or a combination generally over the age of 65, but can affect people at any age. It develops when parts of the brain affect learning, memory, decision-making, and one part. So this is, a, on the left is a normal person, and on the right is a 75-year-old. And you can see the 75-year-old with, um, with a brain that, is, that clearly is atrophied and abnormal signal in the brain. When you look at a healthy brain or an Alzheimer brain, you can see the wasting of the brain that occurs. If you redo PET scans and MRI scans, and you can see the size of the ventricles, the brain shrunk. You can see mild cognitive impairment, and we can measure Alzheimer type uh, findings. The clergy faces inordinate demands, unrealistic expectations uh, with isolation, loneliness, bureaucracy, sometimes poor administrative support, poor working conditions, reduce boundaries of family conflicts. Consequences may include obesity, depression, and hypertension. The New York Times quote, take a break from the Lord's work. Take time off away from renewal. Take a sabbatical. The mind improves concentration, increased clarity and stress. 
The body provides energy, reduces muscle tension, boosts immunity, slows heart rate, reduces blood pressure, and enhances physical <coughs> performance. The stability stabilizes emotions, provides peace and tranquility to the soul, pleases God on Sabbath. So these are definitions that are important. Compassion fatigue. You know, we all want to care. As one of the rabbis said, we're on call 367 days of the year. Um, we have burnout. We have burnout that may consist of depersonalization, apathy, um, that we just can't engage with some of the people. Sleep, we have disordered breathing, and we have vicarious trauma. So we take the trauma, that person's trauma is transmitted onto us when we're beginning to feel the pain and we're suffering and our ability to uh, uh, administer what we need to administer is being hampered. Okay, so what do we do? Reduce regular exercise, healthy diet, social interaction with family and friends. Have a friend, learn new things, take a walk, regular medical visits, supplements, hormones, dementia drugs. They could be uh, uh, additive, but they do not replace all of the above. Spiritual renewal and rest. Prayers and faith that have a support system, have a colleague, have a family, a friend, uh, create a vision and purpose for one's life and getting in touch with the meaning of one's life. Principles of self-care, watch over our own body. I can only take care of you if I take care of myself. It's okay, I don't know, I'm only human. One uh, rabbi said to me, and I've asked multiple rabbis over the past week, and I said, well, what do you think of self-care? And what do you think of telling uh, uh, esteemed rabbis all these things? And one rabbi said to me, well, if I, if, if I can't solve it, it's not a problem. So I think there's a stigma. We want to provide education, and we want to provide an action plan, and we want help. So, what, so basically, we have pain, we have various disorders, and together we feel that respect of our own bodies and taking care of ourselves is going to allow us to take care of people and be more effective in what we do. Uh, we all get frustrated, we all have our weaknesses, we all have our strengths, we have our families, but we think, well, what's more, what's more important to us? What's our legacy? Who am I? Uh, who am I as, uh, as a person? There's a rabbi, a Hasidic rabbi, named Zusa, who once died went to stand up before the judgment at the seat of God. As he waited for God to appear, he grew nervous thinking about his life and how he had done. He began to imagine God was going to ask him, weren't you like Moses or a great leader? Or weren't you not wiser like King Solomon or braver like King David? But when he faced uh, the accounting before God, God simply asked him, were you more like Zaisa? Our challenge in life, our ultimate task in this world, is to be more to our true values, our best selves, our soul radiating through the individual that God created us to be. So um, I know he told me I have five minutes left, but I would really would appreciate if now we could have a discussion. Okay, we have actually 10 minutes, questions and answers from Dr. Mandel. Well, I think uh, questions. What do you, Rabbi? What are your thoughts? <laughs> yes, through our chaplains, uh, we have to take care of ourselves. I'm by myself, you know, chaplain, I'm a diabetic, and I feel a lot of times I'm not taking care of myself. What you say now is really very exciting that we, in order to help others, we have to start to think how we have to take care of ourselves and our families. Comments? Please? Please don't be bashful. <laughs> Rabbi? The only thing I find interesting, you mentioned the term oversleeping. Yes. Now, for a rabbi, the concept of oversleep appears to be non existent. So, could you please explain what that medical condition is and well, how does it cause dementia? couple of things. Number one, sleep apnea is where people may have disordered breathing, they may have both difficulty falling asleep, and they may be snoring at night, and they may have cardiac arrhythmias, and they may be obese and have um, various medical conditions. They fall asleep during the day. 
So number one, they're not functional because they do so, and people feel that those people who get 9, 10, 11 hours of sleep, or those that get 4 hours of sleep, may not be as effective. So the story that I like to give is uh, when you're on a plane, and they advertise uh, that the, when the oxygen mask comes down, um, who do you put it on first? Yourself. So now you can help others. If you drive a car at 90 miles an hour, um, you're going to have a crash. So the answer is um, uh, you have a sort of a healthy lifestyle. You want to eat well, um, you want to eat healthy, um, and Mediterranean diets are felt to be somewhat effective. Exercise is felt to be effective. What we've given to you, actually I made a copy just the past week of the guidelines, which is in your folder for the um, new guide, you look in your folder for the World Health Organization guidelines on what you can do in terms of uh, improving or guiding you when you may have some cognitive impairment. Um, some things are not well studied. What's not well studied is hearing impairment, um, vision impairment, but clearly eating well, taking a break, watching your medical conditions, uh, reduce your smoking, um, and at any time in your life, you can make a difference. At any time, there's no time that's not the right time to start. Not when you have a medical problem, but it's beforehand. And the other questions, I'm very much involved in the uh, Jewish community, involved in disability, uh, and also mental health issues related to um, um, uh, depression, anxiety, loneliness. There's a stigma involved in that. Um, there is a family that they feel isolated, they feel shamed. Um, there's um, sometimes a lack of education or a lack of programs that are available. There may be programs. One rabbi said to me about three weeks ago, I meet many people at the congregation. The first time they come is when I officiate at the funeral for the, someone who is overdosed. Um, and the drugs are rampant within every community. Within the Jewish community, it's no different than any other community related to it. And I think we want to provide education, and there are programs. Last week, um, as I mentioned, I went to the program at, um, at uh, Spanish Portuguese, and I've gone to a number of other programs in uh, Jewish religious institutions, and families are getting there and telling their stories. People get up and they actually say, I committed suicide, I try to commit suicide a number of times and I've never told anybody. Or I have a family that uh, my son is on drugs. Last year when I was at uh, a convention, um, I spoke a little on the subject and one, two women came up to me who were principals of schools and they said to me, I've been to educational programs for 30 to 40 years as principal and vice principal, but nobody ever mentioned those terms. And the question is, and I would ask you in all respect, is when you do a sermon in the, in the service, how comfortable do you feel to talk about addiction, which is in the community? How comfortable do you feel to talk about mental illness? That you feel about that someone who is, uh, might be disabled, that that person may be uh, the same under God. So we had a program um, in one of my synagogues where children who couldn't speak, they could not speak at all, and they were autistic, and we made sure they had a bar mitzvah, because all they had to say was baruch. And a thousand people showed up for one of those meetings, and they were felt equal under God. There's no difference between them. So, you know, it's a little things that you can do. We also did, the uh, last thing I'll tell you, is um, in our synagogue, um, which is now a conservative synagogue, although I, I told Rabbi Silverman I went to seven years of Chesan Sofa. Uh, I did not. Uh, in our, well, I'll send it to you, okay? So in, the, in our synagogue, there's two things. The rabbi says, sometimes people don't know, please stand. So on the Upper East Side here, there's no rabbi who ever says, please stand, and he says, for those who are able, please stand. And many of the people now say, I feel, who are in walkers, say, I feel like a whole person. And second, what we did is we put up a second mezuzah. 
Now, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, so for those who can reach, we had a second mezuzah, so those who can reach the mezuzah, and very, without any fanfare, but just doing little tiny things. On Shavuos, we're having a service of sensitivity. On, on, uh, on Simchus Torah, we have a quiet service for those who don't want to hear loud noises. So I think anything you think about, that just the very little thing shows that not only it's one family, it's like when I heard a couple of rabbis talk and they said, we have a, a meeting of a uh, hundred people come to all my talks. Another rabbi said, you know, that's not the way I do it. I invite one family over on a Shabbos. So I don't think I have to, uh, that's all I have to say. So I'm just a neurologist who unfortunately take care of the people who have the problem. And I'm trying in a little way to bring um, a sort of education uh, and look to you towards knowledge on how I can help people a little better. Thank you very much. People are at, we treat a lot of people from the Jewish community, we treat everybody who comes through, and we've got a lot of success and, and we've got a lot of work. But uh, what I see is really important is everyone should be able to identify, especially <coughs> in, in shul in the mornings. If you know people call you, a lot of times people, you know, I get calls from my patients. Someone else suggested this. What do I think? And I'm sure that you get calls. And I had a story two weeks ago. I got called by someone on on Saturday night that Saturday morning someone came to synagogue, and they ended up not being able to talk, right side became weak, and they called at Sola and they got taken to the hospital, and they actually had a big clot in their brain, blocking off the blood vessel in their brain, and they were able to do a procedure, and, and the guy was discharged three days later to rehab, and he's actually talking, and he's moving, and he's, I, I think he's going to do really well. But what was important was the people who were there recognized that he was having a stroke. And the main things that are there, I have some cards that people can take, and there's something called the Be Fast, which is something that the EMS and that's all are using, and it's something that we do have some slides that we can give you if you want to put up in shul or you want anything. The B stands for balance. If someone walks in and they have imbalance, that seems out of proportion to something that's going on. Their eyes, if someone's having double vision, that sustained um, facial droop. If they have arm weakness, leg weakness, especially the same side, like the right side, arm and leg. Um, slurred speech, but even more problems, getting words out problems. You see they're having real problems. Uh, these are all major pieces, and the T is time because there's a clot buster medication which we can give up to about four hours, four and a half hours, and then the window opens up to about a day. It's now 24 hours, and that is to get that clot out if there's a clot. So it's important that if someone notices it, that they call and they go. And that's all we'll take the patient to the closest hospital that has the facilities to take care of you. So if you, if the patient has anything, it's really important to call. We have everything here. I mean, from my point of view, I always tell my patients, you call, you get taken to the closest hospital, I can always transfer you here. I transfer a lot of patients in here all the time. So it's just really important to, if anyone does notice it when they're there and everyone notice and hear, I usually say weakness, numbness, speech, vision problems, don't just leave it, have it to get checked out. Okay? So if anyone has anything, I'm going to leave a pile of these over here and I can answer any questions if anyone has them. Quick questions to ask? Thank you so much, very much. <laughs> Again, I just want to mention at the conclusion in the program, there are phone numbers that you can reach, including Rabbi Silverman, who can answer any questions about Lenox Hill Hospital. Thank you. Thank you very much for Dr. Mandel, Dr. Lubin. It's now my uh, honor and privilege to call up and introduce Katrina Hartes, clinical nutrition manager and in the hospital who very graciously embraced this event and took part in preparation 
for the event. Thank yeah. you very much for the Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for all having me. Um, I feel very honored to be here and speaking with you all, and uh, hopefully I can impart some wisdom. Um, I know the topic of this session for you all was kind of caring for yourself, um, so I really focus the discussion and information around this to really give an idea of healthy eating to make your, you healthier. Um, and I've heard from your past speaker a lot of things about how healthy eating can enhance your lifestyle, you can bring that to the members of uh, your community, so, um, and I want this to be very informal, so if you have any questions going through, please don't hesitate to stop. Um, that could be kind of a more individual question or a broader scale. Um, like Rabbi Simka said, my name is Katrina Hartog. I'm the clinical nutrition manager here. Um, so for some of you that don't work in healthcare, um, what that really means is I help oversee um, the menu planning and meals, um, the menu planning and meals that we serve for our patients here. Um, so it takes a lot of background work to plan the menu to ensure that it's meeting whether it's religious or cultur cultural preferences um, as well as diet preferences. Um, a little background about myself, I have got my undergrad degree at Boston University um, and then I went on to UCLA to get a master's in public health. In the field of nutrition, you have to get a you have to complete an internship program. So I did that with the Department of Veteran Affairs in Los Angeles. Um, within that organization, I worked in the hospital. I've seen patients um, in home care, so traveling around to see them and provide nutrition services in their home. Um, I worked with overweight and obese veterans in their move clinics as well as outpatients. So I really kind of touched a lot of areas um, in various communities um, and I'd like to, know, like to think that I bring that with me wherever I go. Um, so our goals today, we're, I'm going to try to give you come, some really kind of pointers and tips for healthy eating and what that's going to look like is healthy eating while you're, if you're eating out, but as well as kind of what you can do for snacks. I'm sure you all have very busy lifestyles, so sometimes sitting down really during the day and kind of having a meal is, is not, uh, it, it doesn't happen for you. So I'm hoping that this kind of topic works for you all. Um, kind of looking at choosing this versus that, um, I don't believe that there's any really absolute off-limit foods. It's really looking at your overall diet and um, trying to fit in. So I don't restrict, uh, I mean, I, I limit, but I don't completely cut out kind of sweets or pasta. Um, I don't believe in that kind of diet regimen. So you'll kind of see that in going through these slides. Um, how to make snacking easy and then kind of ideas of healthy snacks. Um, so just a quick kind of icebreaker. Raise your hand if you've eaten out in the last week. How, did you eat out at all yesterday? So some. Um, so, you know, now with all of our busy lifestyles, it's very common that many of us are eating out. Um, so what does that look like? Where can we find healthy, um, healthy foods while we're eating out? Um, on average, so 47% of the food of U.S. food dollars is spent on meals away from home. So, I mean, that's a pretty staggering statistic that not many people eat in their home anymore. Um, so one of my first tips is kind of paying attention to what the menu is describing. Um, so avoiding things like deep fried, pan fried, basted, battered, dipped, if it's describing it as creamy, crispy, or Alfredo, although those sound like very uh, enticing descriptions, what that generally means is higher fat and the higher fat content will have higher calories. So really, if we're trying to eat healthy and balance our calories, whether that's maybe watching our weight, or I think your previous speaker spoke about high uh, cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, or diabetes, really watching foods that are used with this description, you might want to be mindful of. 
versus choosing things that obviously are inclusive of more vegetables and fruits, um, lean meats, stir fries, kebabs, um, if you're into pasta, so things more in a, a tomato sauce or a red sauce versus like an alfredo, which is like a cream sauce. Um, very importantly, make sure you're drinking water with your meals. Um, soft drinks or teas can have extra calories because of the extra sugar. So many of us actually walk around and are dehydrated because we don't drink enough liquids. Um, and balance, get, maybe you're more thirsty than you are hungry, so drinking water can help to quench your thirst um, and overcome that real true feeling of hunger. Um, something to do, to, so enhancing your water. Water can be, can get pretty repetitive after a while, so a lot of things what we do here at Lenox, um, when we do our teaching kitchens, we use our infused water. So basically it's kind of water either with lemon, lime, and any other kind of fruit. So it gives that water a little bit of an enhancement and a different flavor. Um, extra calories, maybe, um, so from alcoholic beverages too. Um, Yes, there are some health benefits, but uh, most of it just comes from empty calories, and you can get those same health benefits if you're actually eating the whole food, fruit, or vegetable. Um, so this one is uh, interesting, but kind of undressing your food. So a lot of times if you're eating foods that are heavily sauced, um, that's just an extra source of calories and, most, and more importantly, salt. Um, so things like salad dressings, spreads, cheeses, or sour cream, um, always recommend if you put it on the side uh, and then you can dress whatever you have inherently. Um, when you put those dressings or sauces on the side, you mixing it in, you will add less than whatever it was coming served to you. Um, and it's just kind of an easy trick or tip to save some calories. Um, topping your baked potato, so topping it with extra veggies. Um, broccoli, salsa, or any kind of cheese, you putting it on again, you'll inherently probably add less. Your speaker before also talked about the Mediterranean diet, which is a focus on um, whole foods and a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, so for us as dietitians, what we generally recommend when you're looking at your plate, make it the majority of it with some kind of fruits and vegetables and the rest of it um, a little bit of protein and maybe some starch. Um, but really focusing on those fruits and vegetables is kind of your most important. Um, if you're kind of guess, asking for a special order, um, so a lot of restaurants, you know, or eating out, they'll automatically give you kind of french fries or some kind of starchy side, but a lot of them will allow you to substitute in for a side dish of vegetables. Um, that's always, or a, a side salad, that's always going to be your better option than those starchy foods. Um, so you can always kind of ask for a special order. Uh, asking something to be broiled or steamed as opposed to having it cooked pan fried or in the fat of whatever they were going to cook it in. Um, using whole wheat bread for sandwiches as opposed to white bread. Again, the whole wheat, or maybe I'll ask a question, why is the whole wheat option better than the white? What is the component in whole wheat that's more important? Fiber. Fiber, very good. Do you know, happen to know why fiber is kind of the gold standard or more nutritious? It helps digestion. Mm -hmm. It helps digestion, it helps keeps you fuller longer. Um, so we can, you know, white bread and white products in general can be processed very quickly through our body. So we actually metabolize them quickly. It doesn't keep us feeling full. Um, it also doesn't help to really bulk up your stool, which then helps kind of keep your intestines and all of uh, your GI tract functioning well. So the whole wheat option is always better. Um, so if you're going out to eat, again, our portion sizes have significantly grown um, in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, if you look at like a mini bagel now, that used to be the traditional serving size of a bagel, and now a, a, a bagel that you would get in a bagel shop is about four times the size, um, which is really staggering. But so if you're going out to eat, you can always kind of split your entree because the sizes or the portions are generally much larger than what we should be eating. Um, 
And some restaurants now even kind of feature the healthier options, either with some kind of little symbol um, or a, a whole separate side menu of kind of lighter options. Um, and the fifth kind of very quick takeaway tip is eating mindfully. Um, and this could mean just taking a couple of extra minutes to sit and savor and enjoy whatever it is that you're eating. Um, like I said, I understand that probably we all lead very busy lifestyles and we want to make sure that we're available for our community members, but taking care of ourselves is very important. Um, does anyone know how long it takes, so you're eating a meal, how long does it actually take for your stomach to send signals up to your brain that I'm full? Does anyone have an idea? You can throw out some numbers. Six weeks. Six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Give some effect. minutes, yeah. Like 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes, yeah. So it really takes 20 minutes because your stomach's a muscle, so it's stretching as you're eating. Um, but if you eat really quickly, uh, you're n you haven't given your stomach the right amount of time to send signals back to your brain like, oh, stop eating, I'm full. So it really takes about 20 minutes to feel that, to send, have the stomach send those stretch receptors back to the brain. So really trying to savor every bite. If you are trying to lose weight, um, that can certainly help because you're going to not want to spend so much time sitting and eating. Um, so you're going to only eat what you have in the 20 minutes. You can have like little um, cheats. So if you kind of chew slower and you take a bite of food, follow it with a sip of a liquid, um, that'll kind of help you inherently eat a little less of the solid. Spend time talking in between bites. So we have to be mindful of activity, right? It's not just about what I'm putting into my body, but it's also about who I'm eating with and kind of that company. Um, avoid eating on the run. Stop and relax before you're full. Um, so this is just, I think uh, you all have the slides in your um, folder. So I'm going to go through these quickly so that I can leave time for question and answer. Um, but this, these were kind of nice. Um, choose this versus that. So if you are eating out or you have, you know, um, recommendations for your community members so you would you would see what the less healthy choice option is versus the healthier choice and these are really s simple easy switches that you can make but will have a large impact on your overall health and diet um, so I, I encourage you to kind of look through the slides and if you don't have them I'll make sure that they get shared to you so that you can kind of peruse these and see which kind of foods or changes that you think would benefit for you um, but a lot of the, the changes from the less healthy to the healthier incorporate some of the other things that we've talked about in these tips before. You know. So if you're eating out kind of at a, at a rest stop or a burger station, um, if, you, if you're eating out at some kind of chicken restaurant, I have taco, and then other kind of sandwich or deli choices. So, you know, this could be incorporated if you're going to grab a sandwich at um, a deli or some kind of uh, self-service station. Um, and then Italian and pizza as well. So the other thing that I kind of wanted to talk about is um, something about snacking. Um, a lot of people have a negative connotation associated with snacking because they feel like it's just extra calories. And then I hear as a dietitian, a lot of people say, oh, well, I, I, I skip meals because I'm trying to watch, uh, watch my weight or lose, um, lose some weight. And really, you have to think about your body as a car. And your car has a fuel tank, right, that you can only fill it up to a certain level. And once you, once you drain all that fuel out, you need to refuel. So your body is like that, and I would say that eating probably actually every four to six hours is going to help keep your metabolism flowing. Um, so that's where snacking comes in, because if you're only eating three meals, you might actually, or even two meals, sometimes you're tricking your body into starvation, you really depleted all your fuel, and you're not going to burn anything more. Whereas if you're eating nice healthy meals or small meals and some snacks in between, you're going to keep your metabolism really revving through the day and helps <coughs> with kick-starting some weight loss and actually keeping it off as well. So these are some just quick tips about snacking. Um, so like I mentioned, smart snacking can aid in weight management or some weight loss. It actually helps to maintain blood sugar, so if you are 
uh, pre-diabetic or even in the um, have been diagnosed with diabetes, snacking is part of a meal plan that's recommended. Um, and then after you consume a large amount of food, your blood sugar is likely to spike. Um, and sometimes that can cause fatigue. So again, going back to if you're only eating two really large meals a day, you eat that large meal, your blood sugars are gonna spike, but what's gonna happen? It's gonna drop back down at some point. So you're gonna feel tired and fatigued. Whereas a small meal throughout the day might again help to kind of ward off that, that overall fatigue as well. Um, so who should really be snacking? So kids, um, people with medical conditions, those wanting to lose weight or gain weight. If you take certain medications, sometimes you have to take it with food. Um, I really say that everyone actually should be snacking and it has kind of a really important um, function within your overall diet. Uh, and ideally, again, five to six small meals a day. Um, so that if you look at it for, through your waking period, that, that could mean eating every about three to four, four to five hours. Uh, three to four hours, depending on the size of your last meal and when your next one might be, that's where a, a healthy and a smart snack can come in. The only one caveat here is that bedtime snacking can be uh, on a slippery slope. Um, because, right, if you're eating very close to bedtime, you are going to fall asleep. And inherently, when we're sleeping, our metabolism does slow down. Um, and blood supply is needed to go into your stomach and your digestive tract to help break down those foods. So uh, what, what's the main purpose of sleeping? Why do we sleep? Okay, recharge your body and more importantly? To recharge your brain. So if you are eating close to bedtime and some of your blood supply is now being sent to help metabolize and digest that food, not all of it is then going to recharge your brain. So that's just where the bedtime snacking becomes a little uh, interesting and time-wise becomes important. Um, so making snacking easy, uh, you know, same thing when you go to a market, um, keep those smart snacks right visually and ready accessible for yourselves. So if it's there, you're more likely to snack on that versus kind of the unhealthier choices. Um, always keeping healthy snacks available wherever it is that you are happening to be. So that could be at work, that could be in your, uh, in your community, in your car, in your gym bag. You know, always have something, uh, something available. The funny thing, I have a six-year-old, but I like to snack as well. I, it's hard for me to eat like a really big meal. So you could probably go into my backpack there and I'll have like six snacks. And I always have something um, on me. Uh, and that's just kind of how it is ingrained in kind of my lifestyle to make sure I have something available. Um, so this is, this is quick tips uh, how, to, how to build that ideal snack or what's kind of the component. Um, so really you want to look for something that has a carbohydrate as well as a protein. So the balance uh, of those two uh, macronutrients is going to help keep your blood sugar up but then also slow down the effect of the glucose getting into the blood. So you're not gonna have that spike. You might have a spike because of the, glu the carbohydrate, but the protein is gonna help slow it down. Yes? What do you say about intermittent fasting? Quite yeah, um, it works for some. So intermittent fasting, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of, um, you'll eat for a certain amount of period during the day and then not eat for a certain amount of period. So sometimes there's like a 12-12, there's a 16 yes. eight. there's different oh, regimens, the um, and it works for some people who need to have that strict okay. structure, and most of the studies are for weight loss. Um, some people, though, are doing it for athletic performance that I know about. I don't, uh, I don't personally resolve to that type of eating regimen, but it works, I, I mean, it's all individual though, so whatever your lifestyle happens to be, it could work for you, but most of the literature shows that it's for aiding in weight loss initially. Um, and sometimes those regimens are hard to really sustain. Um, so, but there, it is kind of the new fad that is coming out. Yes? So those are, you know, a gluten-free diet has a specific place for someone who has uh, intolerance to gluten products. So if you have celiac disease or some of us have just 
uh, GI discomfort from eating foods that contain gluten. Um, again, if you notice, so the best thing that I always tell any of my clients, and if I'm working with someone individually, you have to keep a food record for me. So you will keep a food record and you'll say what time, what you ate and what time that you ate. Um, and then if you're looking because you're maybe not feeling well, and we can tie that or associate that with like a gluten containing food, then we might start an elimination diet. Um, but really if you don't have any of those disease states, um, such as celiac or gluten intolerance, it's not, there's no real necessity to follow. In terms of metabolism, isn't it uh, uh, better to the body to have a gluten-free diet or not necessarily? Not necessarily, no. No. I mean, so you could, there are certain foods that you could substitute going back to that Mediterranean diet. Uh, gluten is mostly right coming from your grain group. So instead of having pasta, which contains gluten, I would tell you to try uh, farro or quinoa or barley. Um, they used to be, right, well, you, you could eat as many egg whites as you wanted. You should watch out for the yolk. And the reason was because of the cholesterol. So they as associated the cholesterol in the egg with the cholesterol that we would measure in your blood. Um, and so they restricted eggs to, I think, like three, three egg yolks per week. Uh, a recent study came out that you can be a little more liberal. Um, and because the cholesterol in eggs, up to a certain point, will not change the cholesterol and the, the bad cholesterols as well in your blood. Um, but still, they s still give a recommendation of no one egg, week. One egg, yeah. one egg a, day. a day, so seven eggs per week. Yeah. And a lot of the patients that I see, maybe Dr. Rosenbluth will comment on it, who have hypertension, um, and they recommend the DASH diet. Yes. Uh, could you comment what that is? Sure. So a DASH diet is, uh, it stands for the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Hypertension is the medical terminology for high blood pressure. Um, so very similar to the Mediterranean diet, it really focuses on eating whole plants, so vegetables and fruits, eliminating your red meat consumption, um, other high fatty meats such as pork, but we don't have to worry about that <laughs> too much here. Um, if you're looking at dairy, you would eat the low fat varieties versus the high fat, um, including nuts and whole grains, so brown rice, quinoa, farro, but really, again, making sure the majority of your plate has those uh, plant foods on it uh, versus kind of the traditional American plate that had a starch, protein, and a little bit of vegetable. Yes? I just want to mention that uh, <clears throat> many of us, though, uh, congregants or people who we work with and others, will have very uh, unique medical conditions where the typical diet uh, is not the appropriate thing for them. Some need to watch their protein. Some people have arthritis, rheumatic arthritis, regular arthritis, protein, kidney. Uh, there's so many different ailments that the average person doesn't realize the association of eating certain foods or beverages that can have a tremendous negative impact yeah. on your health. So, I, you know, if you just address the fact the importance of speaking to a medical person or sure. a dietitian like yourself yeah. to get such a diet for themselves. Um, I mean, so as you heard, my uh, education is rather extensive, and most dietitians, uh, we all have to go through an undergraduate program with an internship. Um, and so it's a, pr a very rigorous and science based profession. Uh, so I like to think that all of the dietitians are kind of our nutrition experts. Unfortunately, uh, our services are not covered in the insurance world as much as we'd like them to be. So when we refer or have physicians refer patients to us, sometimes they do have to pay out of pocket, um, which then deters patients from coming to see us. But there are a lot of community organizations that have dietitians available. Um, I could see what's available and put a list together and certainly share it with you all. Um, here at Lenox, I'm going to say about 60% of the patients that come into the hospital are seen by a dietitian. Unfortunately, that could be the first time that they ever interact with a nutrition professional, and a lot of their medical 
concerns or things that brought them into the hospital, I think our diet connected and we can have a lot of impact, but this might be the one and only opportunity for us to see them. Uh, we do have outpatient dietitians, like I said, so we would try to refer them, um, but it's really spotty right now uh, what kind of coverage we have for nutrition experts. But being that this is a symposium that we need to take care of ourselves, it's really important for everybody to acknowledge that we all have to realize that we will have our own health issues, perhaps, yeah. or family health issues that we need to, and your presentation really addresses that as well as yours. Thank you very much. Of the Rabbanim Medical Alliance. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Adam Rosenbluth, cardiologist at Lenox, Lenox Hill Hospital. I could be the worst speaker you've ever heard, and you're like, why did I clap for that guy? <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm a cardiologist, uh, but I have the, the true uh, honor and blessing of having taken over an internal medicine practice, my father and my grandfather. So, I'm the third generation in the office, so I do, I carried on their tradition of internal medicine, and I added to that cardiology. Uh, when I was asked, and thank you very much for inviting me, when I was asked to come and, and speak today, the introduction I got, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you, like all of us in medicine, devote our lives to taking care of other people, and as a result, we often forget about taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so some ideas about taking better care of ourselves, but of course, we spread that out to our community. I always ask my, I have six women in my practice, over 100, I have more guys in their 90s I can keep count of. I have two guys who, if they make it to 100, will be crawling over the finish line, but they're both at 99, so we'll see. And I always ask them, you know, what could I learn from you that I could teach to my other patients, learn myself, so that I could be a better doctor? And, and that's really what I'd like to share with you today. So I'm here as a cardiologist. I'm going to go through some, I think, very, very cool new stuff that I think is, is, is relevant to our community. But I also want you to know, if you want to interrupt me, Adam, I have a quick question, or can you elaborate on something, just raise your hand or jump right in. Um, I call this an update on diabetes and the risk of congestive heart failure. It's really more of an update on diabetes and heart disease together. Most of you in the room have grown up knowing that diabetes is considered a cardiovascular risk equivalent. So what does that mean? That means that if you and I go out into the community and somebody says, oh, I have diabetes, we should pretend in our mind that they've already had their first cardiovascular event. If we hold them to that standard, then they are less likely to have their first cardiovascular event. So we have higher standards for people who got diabetes, that are similar to the standards of people who've already had a heart attack, bypass, stent, etc. Well, as many of you may know, approximately 20 years ago, there were some new drugs that came out for diabetes. We were really excited because the drugs that we had traditionally were old. Uh, we used to joke that we were treating people to fail. And we needed drugs that actually preserved the function of the pancreas, helped people to live with diabetes longer. And out came these two drugs. And one of them was called Actos, and one of them was called Avandia. You don't need to remember the names, but it's an important point in the history of the timeline of the cardiology and diabetes. Because a few years after those drugs came out, and we jumped on them with reckless abandon, we were so excited to have these new medicines in this old world of diabetes, that they really took the market by storm. Unfortunately, within about five to 10 years of those drugs becoming available to us, we started to see some complications related to the heart. And in fact, we started to see more congestive heart failure. And anytime we diagnose congestive heart failure, we diagnose death. There are people with congestive heart failure who die. We're gonna go into heart failure a little bit more in a moment. As a result, the government said all new diabetic drugs that come out have to go through cardiovascular safety testing. It's sort of typical overreaction of the government. They think like, you know, no other drugs that have to do it, but diabetes had to do it. Well, interestingly enough, it turned out to be a really good thing because we've done a lot of this research over the last 10 to 15 years. And as you might imagine, when you're looking for cardiovascular safety, 
you're not looking for high blood pressure and high cholesterol, you're actually looking for heart attack, stroke, bypass surgery, stent, things that either kill people, hurt people, and or cost our country a lot of money. So when they looked at those things and they compared how often they happened in people on these new drugs versus people on the standard of care, we dramatically reduced them. This is a really big deal for you and me and our community. It's a big deal. Diabetes is epidemic in our society, as many of you know. I heard your last question about medical conditions and, and having to eat properly for them. Um, I took over an amazing diabetes practice from a wonderful old, uh, I'm, I'm here and I'm at Mount Sinai. This was a big Mount Sinai doctor, his name was Stanley Mursky, and he had a large orthodox community that he cared for that I now care for. And you can literally chart their diabetes according to the holidays. Whenever the holidays come and after they pass, their diabetes are totally out of control. And they will come in and say, it's, you know, it was the holidays, as if that's an excuse for them to have not taken good care of themselves. And I know that you would not wish that on anybody, and I try to explain to them that the holidays are no excuse for taking a disease like diabetes not seriously. And that is certainly true of everybody. I think it's, um, if this room were 90 degrees, and then 60 degrees, and then 90 degrees, and then 60 degrees, and you guys complain to me, Adam, it's hot, it's cold, it's hot, it's cold. I say, but the average is 75, that's not bad. You say, but it's never 75, it's either 90 or it's 60. The body's the same way, our bodies like homeostasis. They like that blood sugar to be relatively well controlled all the time. The idea that it's fine to go up for a few months and then down for a few months and then back up for a few months is not healthy for us. In fact, I will show you with a couple of slides tonight that particularly when it comes to diabetes in the heart, as you start to accrue events, you end up in a downward spiral. So your body never forgets the last event that you had. So if you get out of control and have one event, and you say, well, I'll get back into control, you will never get back to the level that you were at. So if you have another event, you're only going to drop lower and lower and lower. So this idea that Dr. Lubin and Dr. Mendel and I talk about, you know, keep your blood pressure controlled all the time. Keep your cholesterol controlled all the time. Keep your diabetes controlled all the time. Means that we should be talking to people about a healthier way of living a way of life, not something where they're punishing themselves here and then rewarding themselves there. We have to really take those words out and think about this more as a healthy way of living. So when it comes to diabetes, as I said, this is groundbreaking data that we have learned. It is so powerful that despite the fact that we do not understand how these two new classes of medicines are working to reduce cardiovascular disease. The American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology have already endorsed them into our algorithms of care, we call our guidelines. There was a large trial that was just released last summer and it was already adapted into the guidelines. Why? Because the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology went over the data and said, we can't stop this. This is too important for us to think to, to not um, take into account. And as you know, guidelines are what change practice. So there can be a lot of good articles out there, but if everyone doesn't read them and adapt them, nothing happens. But when those articles and that research translate into guidelines, people start to follow them and care starts to change. So as we go through these slides, hopefully we can restart this later. Um, again, they're more of a, a guide to you, but I think you'll find some of the information interesting. If we can make the slides change, it'll be interesting. There we go. So, um, what's going on with type 2 diabetes now? Well, 60% of teenagers in the United States are overweight. We are now diagnosing type 2 diabetes in teenagers. We used to think about type 2 diabetes as being an older adult, 50, 60, 70, 80, you start to get type 2. If you had diabetes when you were a teenager, you must have type 1. 
but in fact, that's now changed because of the way we eat. It was so poignant to have that nutritionist up here because the way we eat has directly contributed to obesity in our society, and the obesity is what's driving things like blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, keeping Dr. Lubin and Dr. Mandel in business, unfortunately. So it's a widespread disease associated with multiple cardiovascular outcomes. That's what kind of makes diabetes cool. I know we're up here making it look like a bad disease, but from a cardiology standpoint, it's fascinating because it doesn't just give rise to one thing. Diabetics are at risk for peripheral vascular disease, people losing their toes, their feet, their lower legs. People with diabetes are at risk of stroke, heart attack, bypass, stent, congestive heart failure, and even what we call cardiovascular death. So currently about one in 10 Americans has diabetes. That's enormous. Um, almost 90% of those patients are overweight or obese. The majority have a blood pressure that's above the recommended, uh, and these are, uh, you know, I don't know if you followed, and I don't wanna waste your time. Blood pressure recommendations have kind of bounced all over the place. Um, you know, many of you will hear less than 120 over 80 is appropriate. You'll hear that you know below 140 over 90 is appropriate. In the past, we wanted everybody below 140 over 90. We have now identified certain groups that we would like lower. Basically, we'd like everybody below 120 over 80, but we're not gonna start therapy until they get above 140 over 90, unless they have a predisposing condition. Diabetes, we'd like below 130 over 80. Um, so it basically 140 over 90 still remains a cutoff for um, the diagnosis of high blood pressure. Almost half of, of what we call end stage kidney disease or dialysis is related to diabetes. And about 50% of people with diabetes may develop heart failure according to the American Di uh, Diabetes Association. That bullet in the lower right hand corner I'm sure every speaker who's had the privilege of speaking with you guys today hopes that you'll remember one or two things. I hope that that lower right hand corner is one of the things that you will remember. Heart failure is a terrible diagnosis for us to make. It has a five year 50% mortality. That's deadlier than most cancers that we diagnose. It's the leading cost center for Medicare in the United States. Longest length of stay in a US hospital and the leading cause of hospitalization for people 65 and older in the United States. So when you hear about heart failure being a bad disease, say yes, okay, I'm sure we all know that. But then when you recognize that 50% of patients with diabetes may develop heart failure, now you start to put together a link that's important for you and me and for our community of diabetes leading to heart failure and what we can do to prevent that from happening. So my objectives, and again, I'm gonna go through the slides relatively quickly because it's really about a consistent message, but I'll sort of reiterate it with the different slides. I'd like you to understand the scope and the impact of type two diabetes focusing on the risk of heart failure. I'd like to provide an overview of heart failure and the risk factors for heart failure that are unique to diabetes. Discuss how to assess risk and improve diagnosis of heart failure in people with type two diabetes in the primary care setting. This is a good message for us to get out. And recognize that renal and cardiovascular disease are closely interconnected with type 2 diabetes. So, when we think about diabetes, it's an interesting disease. Again, I know everybody thinks when you say a disease, we should just call it a bad thing. But diabetes is fascinating because not only is it a process that damages multiple organs in the human body, it's one of the few conditions that you and I can actually work on to make our patients, our community healthier. So if you see somebody starting to become a diabetic, you know, you see somebody, listen, you're overweight. I've noticed you're continuing to gain weight. Have you been screened for diabetes? Has your doctor, have you gone to the doctor? You should be screened every year for your diabetes. If you have been screened, are you aware of the risks that are associated with it? What do you mean? Diabetes affects the pump, so it affects the heart. It affects the plumbing, all the arteries in our body, and the filter, the kidneys. Multiple organ systems involved, all of which will continue only to get worse if diabetes is not treated, but can actually get better if we improve our diabetic control. So heart failure, atherosclerotic coronary vessel disease, and kidney disease. 
People with type 2 diabetes are at greater risk of developing heart failure and being hospitalized due to heart failure. It wouldn't be such a big deal except that the number one predictor of death in heart failure is being hospitalized for heart failure. I don't know if you know this, but at, place, at hospitals, we are penalized. If we diagnose somebody with heart failure, we admit them for heart failure, discharge them, and they come back within 30 days, we get in trouble. Why? You don't get in trouble if somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes and you know, gets admitted and they come back, or pneumonia and come back. I have a guy upstairs with asthma. You know, if I discharge him tomorrow and he comes back in a week, nobody's going to care. He might care, but nobody else is going to care. But I admit somebody with heart failure, discharge him, and they come back within 30 days, the hospital is actually dinged for that. They are penalized for that. And it's because it is a predictor, not only is it a huge cost center for our system, but it's a predictor of death. You may have people in your community say, oh yeah, I have heart failure. First question you ask is, have you ever been in the hospital for it? Kind of like asthma or emphysema. They say, no, I've been fine for years. That patient's doing great. But like asthma or emphysema, if somebody says, oh yeah, I was just in the emergency room two weeks ago, and a month before that, three months before that, then you know that that person is not well controlled. They need to go see their doctor and get their asthma or emphysema under control. It's the exact same thing with heart failure. Somebody says, oh, I was told I had that years ago, but I, everything's fine, that's great. But if you think about heart failure, what's interesting, the greatest drug that we have had in terms of a trial and, the, and getting good results, the greatest drug in the history of heart failure is a drug that recently, well, relatively recently came out. We have it available now. It's a drug called Entresto. You don't need to memorize that. What you need to know is that the reduction in morbidity and mortality associated with that drug, greatest drug in the history of heart failure. You think, oh, it must have been like a 75% reduction in morbidity and mortality. No. 60? No. 50? No. It was a 40% reduction in morbidity and mortality. Now, from a cardiology standpoint, that's amazing. But for somebody who's got heart failure to know that the best drug in the history of heart failure only reduced morbidity and mortality by 40% is a little disappointing. So the whole goal of heart failure is to prevent it from happening in the first place. So again, my main message today is to remember that diabetes can cause heart failure. If you know that pathway, then you can either A, diagnose it earlier, or B, perhaps prevent it from happening in the first place, because progressing with heart failure is a bad thing. About the cost of medical care. Preventable. Diabetes adds a constant risk of heart failure, independent of age. So what you see in red is diabetes. What you see in the gray is not diabetes. This is a technical slide. I don't want to waste your time on the technicality. The left side is what's called prevalence, and the right side is called incidence. These are two different ways to look at the, uh, diagnosis. One has to do with um, age and recurrence. And basically what you'll notice is Throughout your life, you're always at greater risk of developing heart failure. It's not like, oh, when you were younger, you were at higher risk. It's literally, the risk is maintained proportionally throughout the life of being a diabetic. So no matter how old you are with diabetes, you are still at a markedly higher risk of heart failure. There's a high prevalence, prevalence of undiagnosed heart failure. So again, that one thing I want you to think about heart failure, but we'll expand a little bit on it, particularly for our community, to think about the lack of diagnosis. Coming up to you saying, Adam makes a big deal about the heart and diabetes. Which of those five things am I most likely to face as a healthy diabetic? Not a diabetic who's already had something. This is a newly diagnosed healthy diabetic walks into your office and says, what am I most likely of those five things to have to deal with? So a couple of just basic terms in terms of the heart. So what do we mean by heart failure? Well, basically there's two types of architecture of the heart that can result in heart failure. One type is from a long period of damage to the heart muscle from a lack of blood. So people who had a heart attack, they've got blocked arteries, they needed stents, they had bypass surgery, 
what we would call ischemic heart disease. So over time, the heart muscle doesn't get enough blood. Like anybody who doesn't get enough of what they want, they start to not behave well, they get weak and tired. So that's the common method. There's also a newer idea of heart failure, and it's what we call diastolic heart failure. <clears throat> this is a form of heart failure where the heart can squeeze well, but it doesn't relax well. If I were to give you some images in your mind, a couple of years ago, if we talked about heart failure, every doctor in the room would assume that you were talking about a heart that looked like a balloon that you inflated. Maybe you got it at the circus, brought it home, and a week later you untied it. It would never go back to its original shape. It'd be kind of baggy and, and soft. And if you blew it up, it still would never go back to its original size. That's what we call systolic heart failure. The heart's not pumping well anymore. Diastolic heart failure is where the heart does not relax well. As a result of not relaxing well, it doesn't fill well. Well, you may remember, the heart fills from the lungs. So if the lungs cannot fill the heart well because it's not a warm, welcoming environment, it's gotten stiff, then the pressure is going to back up into the lungs. So interestingly enough, people can present with the same symptoms regardless of what type of heart failure they have. If their heart's not pumping well, that means the blood's not leaving the heart going back out to the body, so the traffic backs up into the lungs. If it's not filling well, the traffic also backs up into the lungs. So no matter what form of heart failure we're talking about, people can suffer the same way. They have comparable morbidity and comparable mortality as well. But you should be aware that we now talk about two types of heart failure. Systolic, which is a weak pump, or diastolic, which is impaired filling. In very simple terms, a normal heart function is a contraction of greater than 50%. So if the heart fills up with 100 milliliters of blood, we expect at least 50 milliliters to leave when the heart pumps. If it pumps less than that, we say the ejection fraction is down. Again, that's a sort of a traditional thought process of heart failure. Now we talk about diastolic, where the ejection fraction may be normal, but they still have heart failure. And I see this every day. I lecture probably once a week on cardiovascular disease. And people will tell me all the time, like, oh, I had a patient, they came in, they were short of breath. And when they came in with their shortness of breath, I got an echo thinking maybe it was their heart, but the pumping function was normal. So it couldn't have been their heart. And I say, no, you're wrong. Maybe they had that diastolic dysfunction, that heart that didn't relax well. So, hospitalizations for heart failure are on the rise, particularly in the diabetic community. This is a fascinating slide, at least to me, because it breaks everything down for you in terms of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. This is what I call a concrete slide. So the highest risk of death is if you have diabetes and a low ejection fraction. The next is diabetes with preserved ejection fraction, that diastolic that we just spoke about. A little bit below that is diabetes, is no diabetes, but heart failure. And then at the very bottom is no diabetes and normal heart. So if you look on this slide, it's amazing how concrete it is. If you've got diabetes and a bad ventricle, you are at about three times greater risk of death. It just, it's nice for me because you see normal is really that dotted gray line at the bottom and then just increments of how bad diabetes is when it comes to heart failure. Major risk factors, obesity, hypertension, bad cholesterol, advancing age, sleep apnea. I don't think anybody gave a talk on that today, but I'm sure you're all aware of apnea and what a big deal it is. Um, you know, if you know that somebody or you hear that you are snoring during the night and sometimes you almost choke and stop breathing, that's what we call obstructive sleep apnea, that's a direct risk. And then we talked about heart and kidney disease. 
What are some of the symptoms of heart failure? Shortness of breath, fatigue, trouble sleeping, coughing at night, and then on the right are what the doctor may see. This is what I mentioned to you earlier about the way heart failure accumulates over time. So you can see each dip in this curve is an acute event. But with each acute event, you never come back to where you were beforehand. That's why this is such an important diagnosis to make. Um, there are blood tests that we can do. So it's not a bad idea if you're going to see the doctor and you want to make sure that you get your sugar checked, say, oh, am I a diabetic? Am I at risk of becoming a diabetic? And you hear the answer is yes. The next time you're at the doctor, you may say, what about any special blood test to look at my heart? We call it BNP or pro-BNP, but you just need to know there are blood tests that we can do to look at this. You are six times more likely as a diabetic <clears throat> to die if you have chronic kidney disease. So again, if there was nothing to do about it, we'd make a big deal about it. We wouldn't make a big deal about it. But because there's so much we can do to protect the kidneys, we make a big deal about it. 26% of patients with type 2 diabetes have diabetic kidney disease, resulting in a reduction in kidney function. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this slide. So it's important to identify patients early. So A, I hope that everybody knows to get yourself screened for diabetes every year. And age, as I emphasized earlier, is no longer, uh, there's no cutoff. Type 2 diabetes remains an independent risk factor for heart failure and hospitalization for heart failure. More than one in four patients with type 2 diabetes has undiagnosed heart failure. Heart failure occurs in type 2 diabetics, both subtypes that we talked about, increasing morbidity and mortality. And people with type 2 diabetes are at increased risk of kidney dysfunction, which eventually could also contribute to an increase in cardiovascular events and hospitalization. So this is my last slide. This is what I wanted to show you. So if you look here, and I apologize, the type's a little bit slow, a little bit low, but the number one thing a diabetic is most likely to present with from the standpoint of heart disease is peripheral arterial disease. About 16% of people who are diabetics, that'll be the first thing that they get diagnosed with. Everybody thinks about heart attack and stroke? No. Number two is heart failure. This is new. We are literally talking about this topic this year. We didn't talk about this two or three years ago. Heart attack and stroke are about equal at about 10 to 11 percent. Cardiovascular death is at 4 percent. So this is a wonderful way to summarize our conversation together because it highlights how important the risk of heart failure is to diabetic patients. It also highlights that it's something that we can diagnose, that it's often present before we know it, that you're not going to have a warning sign. Often if you get the warning sign, it's been around for too long. So not only do we know that we're at risk for this if we're diabetic, but we want to now actually proactively go out and get diagnosed with it rather than wait for something to happen that would make it more obvious. And as I said, there are basically two brand new classes of treatment for diabetes. One, an injectable agent will have oral therapies. You'll see some of these advertised, Victoza, Ozempic, Trulicity, all of which not only treat diabetes, but also treat the heart. And then a bunch of other ones that you'll also see advertised, Jardiance, Farsiga, and you'll see commercials on television talking about cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So what makes tonight's discussion, at least for me, particularly cool to share with you, is all this knowledge around diabetes and heart failure, but also the knowledge around these new drug classes that have been out, by the way, for well over five years. It's not, you know, we always joke in medicine, test it on the Europeans, and then bring it to the US. <laughs> they've been tested on the Europeans for many, many, many years, and now they've been in the US for about five years. And we're seeing all of the drugs in each of these classes consistently deliver the same message. So there's no flukes. This is a consistent message that I, I mentioned earlier has changed guidelines. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. Does anybody have any questions?
Yes, sir. The uh, reference between AF and diabetes. What is the... Uh... AF being atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is an electrical disease, and it's a very good question to ask because it turns out... I didn't want to get too scientific, but what diabetes does to the heart is it increases scar tissue in the heart, fibrosis. And not only can the heart muscle develop fibrosis, not only can the heart arteries develop fibrosis, but the electrical system can. So there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation and diabetes. Unfortunately, as Dr. Lubin and Dr. Mendel may have mentioned, oftentimes the first time they ever see a patient with a stroke, they're the ones diagnosing atrial fibrillation. So what I would say in brief is yes, diabetes increases your risk for atrial fibrillation, and B, just like getting diagnosed with diabetes, you should make sure that at least once a year you get your electrocardiogram when you see your doctor. And also, you know, everybody has these new devices. Everybody's got their iPhones on the table. You can check your pulse on those. So we're getting a lot of patients coming in saying, Adam, Dr. Rosenbluth, I think something's wrong with my heart. I say, why? Well, I was doing my pulse on my iPhone and it gave me a message or with my watch, it gave me a message. We're actually getting people coming to us with AFib, which is nice because hopefully we get them before they have an event. But yes, you are at increased risk for it with diabetes. I want to thank Rabbi Blank for inviting me and for all the work that he's put into this to go through Rabbi Hammer. I want to thank National Council and the Medical Alliance of America. I want to, of course, uh, the uh, Sanya, the host, we have uh, Lennox Hill, and particularly Rabbi Silverman, and, and Dr. Mandel, appreciate your talks. Dr. Lubin was here, the other Dr. Rosen uh, Bluth, and Hartog. I uh, so want to acknowledge all of them. And as well, I wanted to uh, apologize in advance. I, I may have to leave early before the end of the conference in terms of being able to be here for questions and answers. Uh, something came up uh, earlier today. I will check on it uh, after the session, and then I'll be know, able to know for sure. So I apologize if, if, uh, if I can't stay through the rest of the evening um, after the uh, tour, or for the tour and afterward. But uh, for now, let's uh, move on. I'd like to discuss from a halakhic perspective from a hashkafic perspective, uh, philosophically, theologically, halakhically, the obligations, requirements, mandates, uh, necessities of clergy, ourselves, to take care of ourselves. And to uh, perhaps, based on the principle, though not specifically applicable in this case, but uh, that there is a certain prioritization of ourselves. Uh, it was mentioned before as well. In fact, Dr. Mendel gave the example of the, uh, air, of the oxygen mask. So I want to draw your attention to a couple of articles that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, two of these articles, uh, couple of these references, actually I did not, did not find myself. Last week was the Rabbinical Council of America conference, and they had these in their booklets, in the handouts. There is a very nice article entitled Occupational Distress and Health Among a Sample of Christian Clergy, uh, published as part of Pastoral Psychology. Uh, you can, it was printed and published online. It's, it's the author is Benjamin Webb. You can find it on the web. But uh, Benjamin Webb is the, uh, is the author. They, just to briefly read to you a little bit, there was a study done regarding the occupational distress, physical mental health, health behaviors among clergy, a sample of full-time Christian clergy, 221, completed a questionnaire that included, included the following uh, a scientific assessment method called Clergy Occupational Distress Index. Clergy Occupational Distress Index. Uh, so you can look at that article. There's another article that was uh, entitled Clergy Wellness, an Assessment of Perceived Barriers to Achieving Healthier Lifestyles by a number of authors. Uh, published in 2016, Journal of Religion and Health, Clergy Wellness. Uh, one of the things that's mentioned in this that I think we can all relate to is lack of family time was the most frequently reported personal barrier to achieving a healthier lifestyle. An unpredictable work schedule was reported as the most frequent professional barrier to achieving a healthier work style. Two, there was also an interview done on NPR radio uh, back in 2010 that you might find interesting to look at. It, it was titled on uh, religion on NPR, clergy members 
suffer from burnout, burnout, which was mentioned as well by Dr. Mendel. Clergy members suffer from burnout and poor health. And there was an interview done regarding that as well. Wanted to add to those, uh, as per the RCA, wanted to add to those. There is, uh, I don't know if it was a symposium reference, but it's, you can find it online. If you uh, Google Holston.org, H-O-L-S-T-O-N.org, Holston.org, there's a, a paper presented, some 50-page paper. And what's interesting about that uh, paper, just from our perspective, to put our discussion into a certain uh, context, is that they have four sections that they address in that presentation. One is the emotional well-being of clergy, physical well-being of clergy, intellectual well-being of clergy, and spiritual well-being of clergy. So if you think about it for yourselves, if you want to assess your own kind of well-being in those four parameters or those four spheres, emotional, physical, intellectual, and spiritual, uh, that might be something of, uh, of worthiness as well. Aside from that, I really wanted to uh, and focus more on a halachic in discussion about one's obligation, lack thereof, perhaps preference to, as we'll see in terms of how the Torah, how the halacha looks at one's responsibility in terms of taking care of oneself. And I want to give some specific examples and discuss some specific interesting perspectives. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to uh, mention is that uh, there is a wonderful work in halacha and refua that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, written by Rabbi Dr. Uh, Professor Avraham Steinberg, a pediatric uh, neurologist at Shara Tzedek. Uh, he was actually at the RCA conference last week. He comes in a lot. So he uh, wrote uh, a very important work. So, no, it was originally six volumes to seven volume work called Encyclopedia Halachatit Refuit. It's been translated by Dr. Fred Rosner. But uh, Encyclopedia Halachit Refuit. So he has a whole section on riut, on health. And well-being, and he has a whole—he you know, has a little section that talks about the difference of opinion amongst Rishonim and Achronim as to whether it's appropriate or inappropriate to interpret a certain mitzvos in the Torah as having a component of promoting health and well-being. There is a major group of Rishonim and who feel that a secondary aspect of many mitzvos in the Torah. Or is de were designed to promote health and well-being. And there's a group that opposes that approach, and that that's not at all what it's about. One of the preeminent Rishonim, who's of that opinion, is the Ramban. The Ramban has a work in the uh, Kisvei HaRamban. One of its smaller works is a like essay section called Torah Hashem Tamima. And in Torah Hashem Tamima, the Ramban has a discussion about a number of mitzvos and how he feels that each of these mitzvos has a secondary health benefit that was incorporated into God's uh, divine and infinite wisdom in terms of why he commanded us these missiles. So whether they be positive missiles, I say, whether they be negative missiles, los, I say. So he gives examples and some of the medical implications of it. The Ramban was a physician, as you know, as was the Rambam, as was the Sforno. Uh, the Rambam was a physician, as you know, historically, because his brother was supporting him, and then his brother perished at sea in business, and then he became a physician because he had to make a living, which is why most physicians go into it, to make a living, but not anymore, because they can't really make a living in medicine. That's why I went into the rabbinate. So... <laughs> So the Ramban has a discussion about how the Torah Mi'ira Seinai Besod HaTolada in terms of giving birth and in terms of generations. Sha'as HaTolada makes us famous it forbid certain animals, certain things in terms of nutritional aids. So one of the examples that the Ramban gives of a category of prohibition of Isra in the Torah that has a medical associated either negative disadvantage and therefore it's prohibited is the example of Anish Savur, he says that uh, about certain behemoths, the chen hadagim, the non-kosher fish that is prohibited in the Torah, he feels has an associated medical disadvantage, harm, potential detrimental effect, those fish items that are prohibited by the Torah. And he says that these have an effect on reproductive ability and whatever other health, perhaps, uh, that he might suggest, I think, reproductive. So that's an example of a preeminent Rishon who's of the opinion 
that not no, the, whether the question whether the Torah promotes, requires, mandates that we take care of ourselves and health, in, a, in addition to spiritual, is the fact that according to the Ramban and others, there is an intrinsic aspect to many mitzvos that, while not pr not necessarily the primary, certainly not the primary reason for the mitzvah, but an important secondary incorporated reason was to promote health or to prevent. Uh, uh, deleterious effects. And one example is Doug Tommy. Those, that's why I think that's how they interpret, I don't know if he quotes here, Dr. Steinberg quotes the Pasuk, I think in, uh, in Shemini when it talks about non-kosher fish, the Torah uses the term vinit mesem bum, or a fish or non-kosher vinit mesem. So vinit mesem there, one of them appears without an olive. It's chaser olive. It's vinit mesem without an olive. The reason is because, at least Adir HaDrush, because then you can read the word, not just v'nit mesim tuma, but v'nit mesim from timtum. Timtum like timtum halev, which means basically having an ischemic event that Dr. Uh, Willenthal was talking about, having kind of blockage, obstruction in the cardiovascular system, that's timtum halev. So the Gemara talk, the concept of timtum halev refers to more of metaphysical, talk about something that has a negative effect on one's soul. But uh, they interpret that there's a certain aspect of actual actual health that can be generated from, from mitzvahs. There's the source in the Torah that says that we have to protect ourselves in terms of taking care of our health, in terms of particularly preventive, in terms of screening, in terms of having, whether screening for diabetes, screening for other things that we'll come to, in terms of that we understand, we know that there are many basic principles in the Torah that if a person is in a state of potential threat of life, so we know that we suspend Yom Kippur, we suspend Shabbos, we suspend just about everything in order to prevent loss of life. So we know how important that is. The Rambam has a very beautiful description in Hilchah Shabbos about the ways of the Torah, and not Achazorios, in terms of suspending Shabbos to save life. You know that, but is there a specific mitzvah in the Torah that requires us to take care of ourselves, to be involved actively in preventive medicine, in terms of healthy lifestyle, eating style, and the like? So we know the Rambam uh, has a major emphasis on that. The Rambam incorporated it into his uh, Yad HaChazaka. The Rambam wrote Yad HaChazaka over a 10-year period of time in Hilchas Deus, as you know, in Hilchas Peragimel, Peragdal, and Peragay, the Rambam has a whole discussion. He has a more expanded discussion in other works that he's written, but here he has a discussion about health, a lot of focus on nutrition. He also talks about exercise and the importance of exercise. We're going to come back to one part of that Rambam toward the end, but uh, the, we know that the Rambam certainly has a major... Pardon me. The Rambam has a major focus in terms of his own incorporation into his halachic work of health. The question is, what is the mitzvah, what is not? So we generally assume that the source of the mitzvah of taking care of one's health and self-care is based on two psukim, both in Parshas Vaschanon. The Pasuk says, Raki Shomer Lecha, Oshmar Nafshecha Ma'od, and Vrishmartem Ozu Nafshu Seichem. So that's, in fact, the Rambam quotes that. In Hilchus Rotseach, the Rambam quotes that source. You should protect yourself. Protect yourselves very, very much. And then, you should be very careful and diligent about protecting yourselves. So if you look at the Torah Tamima, there in the Perak Dalit, in the fourth chapter of uh, Sefer Dvarim, Deuteronomy, the Sukkim there, so the, Mar the Tartumia has a discussion. He make, quotes the Marsha. <coughs> Marsha Meseches Brachos says that these Sukkim have nothing to do with taking care of one's health. These Sukkim have to do with not forgetting the Torah, Pantishkach Hasadvarim. It's nothing to do with physical. All these Sukkim have to do with spiritual preservation. So how can one interpret these Sukkim as referring to a mandate to protect one's body? So he says, as Marshall says, they're not. It's a, <coughs> perhaps a reference, a smachta, but it's not a specific source. The problem is that the Rambam does quote these psukim. He specifically quotes these psukim. When the Rambam quotes the requirement to ensure that one's environment is safe from any kind of potential harm or danger, quotes these psukim. The Rambam clearly does interpret these psukim in a way that is a reference to some kind of specific source in the Torah that requires to us to take care of ourselves. 
the Kliyakar, <coughs> excuse me, If you look at the Kliyakar there in, in Devarim and in Vilschanon, Kliyakar has a very interesting interpretation of that Pasuk. He says you divide the Pasuk into two parts, Rak Hishamer Lecha, pause, Hishmor Nafshecha Ma'od. Hishamer Lecha says the Kliyakar is Hainu Shmiras Haguf. That's a reference to protecting one's physical being. Hishamer Lecha, for yourselves. Hishmor Nafshecha Ma'od, he says, refers to Shmiras Hanefesh one's spiritual well-being. And he says that when it comes to protecting one's physical being, it just says, Hishomer Lecha, be careful. When it comes to protecting one's spiritual well-being, it says, Yishmor Nafshecha Ma'od, be exceptionally careful or protective. So the Kliyakr says that's because the necessity to protect one's spiritual well-being is a greater necessity. He says that, Tzarech HaAdam Lihisahir Beyoser, that perhaps the uh, risks are greater in terms of spiritual well-being than in terms of spiritual, and therefore one has to be particularly meticulous in protecting one's spiritual. But he clearly interprets the first part of the Pasuk as referring to protecting one's physical. If you look at the mission of Rura, mission of Rura at the end of Simon Kufnun Hay, where it talks about uh, kind of the conclusion of one's morning practice when one is transitioning from shul and davening and learning to, to look at going out to, to the workplace and the likes. So the last comment that the Mishnah Brewer has in Simon Kufnun Hay in Sifkat Nir Aleph, U mitzvah, he writes, it's a mitzvah, it doesn't define what the nature of the mitzvah is or the source of the mitzvah, but he just says, U mitzvah lehanhig atzvah b'mida tova, b'hanaga tova, a person should conduct oneself, you have to get a routine in terms of appropriate behavior and conduct, lishmor bri uso, to protect one's health, kidei shiye bari, so that a person can be healthy, vechazak, and strong, avodos habori yisalem, for able to serve God. He doesn't quote his source. So the uh, Shulchan Aruch, if you look in Choshen Mishpat, it's Chof Zion, and Siv Ches, the uh, writes the following, <clears throat> I think this is based on the Rambam. Any kind of potential dangerous ob uh, object, obstacle, or any kind of environmental danger. There's a positive mitzvah, says the Mechaber, to remove it. To be careful from it. So the Mechaber certainly, like the Rambam, is based on these psakim, finding a base specific source in the Torah to prevent oneself. Come back to that in a moment. And if a person did not remove these impediments or dangers, and which can come to Sakana, then a person has negated a mitzvah and violated a mitzvah. So, one could argue, therefore, just to pause for a moment, one could argue, therefore, that if one doesn't, let's say, have a routine annual physical right, with routine cholesterol checks and, and uh, blood glucose and uh, whatever other else, we'll come to a few exam specific examples shortly, that one is in violation of these mitzvahs assay, one is in negation of these mitzvahs according to the Rambam. It's not just a mitzvah like a nice thing, it's not just recommended, it's not just some, well, but it's an actual neglect of a mitzvah. Does that necessarily apply to situations or behaviors that are not necessarily directly linked to life-threatening conditions, just in terms of general uh, health and welfare, um, whether certain activities, just in terms of general, if a person doesn't necessarily have any specific risk factors for heart disease. So is the requirement to exercise or be or more careful with nutrition? Person has perfect cholesterol levels, person has uh, perfect whatever, cholesterol levels, which mean not only they have a perfect um, low LDL level, the bad cholesterol, they have a, sometimes perhaps, according to, depending, might even be more important, they have a appropriately high enough level of HDL, the good cholesterol, but either way, so that person in the nurse would do, they have to necessarily be so careful when it's not necessarily sekonus of So on a practical level, I'm not sure how much it makes a difference because all of these things can potentially, can potentially lead to life-threatening conditions and life-threatening. The question is that they're not necessarily immediate. But what I'd like to uh, uh, answer, I'd like to pose a question and talk about a particular opinion 
and then answer that question. The question is that uh, many ask, is that if you look in the Sefer HaMitzvot, if you look at the Rambam, for example, his list of 613 mitzvot, nowhere does he actually quote a source or a mitzvah that there is an obligation to take care of oneself or promote one's health. He links it in Ziyad HaChazaka to Raki Shomer and Nishmartim, but he doesn't actually list those as any one of those as a mitzvah in the Torah. So why does the Rambam not incorporate what he seems to consider to be Minat Torah biblically mandated, he doesn't actually list it in the 613 mitzvah. So that's a question that uh, is discussed very interestingly in Sefer Binyan Av by one of the former uh, Sephardic chief rabbis of Israel, Rabbi Leo Bakshi Doron, in his Sefer Binyan Av. So in, uh, in Simen, in Chelek Aleph Simen, Nun Aleph and Chelik Bey Simen Ayin Gimel, he has a discussion of this. I'd like to come back to his answer, which is how I'll conclude, but before that, as a segue to that, I wanted to share with you the following. In addition to Dr. Steinberg's uh, wonderful work in Cyclopedia La Chetid Rifli, so the other so source that I'm sure you're familiar with, which is a different style and different approach, and the two of them together are just uh, kind of essential halachic Rufua medical sources for rabbinic um, p professionals. That is Nishmas Avram, or Nishmat Avram by Dr. Abraham, Sukhar <coughs> Abraham, who's a retired internist uh, from Sharet Zedek. So he wrote a number of svarim. Nishmat Avraham is kind of his major work, going through all of Shulchan Aruch, from Orachayim to the end of Choshen Mishpat, and any sif, any simon, any sif that has to do with something medical, then he quotes all kinds of sources, and he quotes many uh, specific personal. Uh, opinions of Rishlom Zan Orbach, or Vel Yashiv, or Vnoyworth, and all the likes. It's a very important work. So he has the following. And I was actually, I just, I didn't end up having the time. I was actually going to call him today. I have called him many times in the past uh, to consult with him because I wanted to ask him this question because I'm, I'm going to take issue with something that he quotes. It's not necessarily his own opinion he's quoting. But I wanted to try to get a better understanding of it. I didn't. So I'm just going to present the question that I have about it in opinion. In Choshen Mishpat, in Simen Tov Chav Zayin, in that Simen talks about requiring to protect ourselves, he poses the following question. Ha'im yesh chiv adam bari. A person is otherwise healthy. Is that person obligated, halachically, libadek, to be tested? Kedei limnoa, to prevent machalot, various diseases. So are you obligated to, let's say, have a colonoscopy? That's one of the examples that he gives. The recommendations are generally at the age of 50 to have a baseline colonoscopy and then every 5-10 years, depending, colonoscopies, there are some recommendations that push it back to the age of 45. But I'm not going to ask people here, but if you, anyone here is 45 or 50 or older, this is uh, when Rav Neuwirth was still living, uh, from Shemir Shabbat Kol Chasa, She'ein Kol Chiyuv, there is no absolute a priori obligation, She'adam Yitzayet Laham Latzot that a person must follow these medical advisory uh, considerations, and uvadai, and certainly so, in whom a if he's afraid of these tests. Why is a person afraid of uh, a blood cholesterol level? Maybe colonoscopy, a person can be a little anxious, yes, uh, that, that's true. Maybe that's what he says, mitchell. Yes, but the Machaber says that you're obligated to remove any potential hazard that's life-threatening. So what, why, why is that the case then? If a person actually has the beginnings of colorectal cancer and doesn't do the screening, then that colorectal cancer, by the time it is diagnosed, will probably have metastasized. If a person does have high cholesterol, so what is that, so how do you explain that? So he says, Masha Muva that you have to remove any potential health hazard or risk. That's when it's Vlashiyesh Mikshol Mamashi Befanov. When there's an actual danger right present now. So again, I didn't understand that because if the person actually has beginnings of colorectal cancer, then it's there. The person doesn't know it. But why does Allah say you have to be aware of it? If a person has hypertension, high blood pressure, that's the nature of hypertension. It's a silent killer, high cholesterol. So I didn't understand this. I don't. I don't understand it. Because um, it seems that it should be absolutely required. Um, and the reason for that, and this is how I'll conclude, 
is because of the way Rebbe Leo Bakshi Doron explains the answer to the question, how come the Rambam doesn't list the requirement to protect one's health as one of the Taryag mitzvos, of the 613 mitzvos? So he answers in a very fascinating suggestion. He says that there are certain mitzvos, he says, that, uh, based on the Rambam, that's what I want to quote, the Rambam writes in the beginning of the Parag Revi of Hilchus Deos, that a healthy body is part of being divine. It's part of kind of imitating God. Mahu afato. And not and and Rambam goes on to say that a person can't function religiously without having a healthy body. So he says that the reason for this is just like the Ramban explains the Bahag's opinion. Bahag's opinion is that there is no commandment in the Torah to believe in God. Mitzvah of Muna, the Rambam's first mitzvah in the Tariyak Mitzvah is the belief in God. So Bahag deletes that. He, no, 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 no such mitzvah. So the Ramban explains because according to the Bahag, that's a fundamental principle that pre, it's a prerequisite to Tariyak Mitzvah. Tariyak Mitzvahs are 613 technical obligations that a person has to manifest. If a person doesn't believe that God exists, then all the 613 mitzvahs fall apart. So he says that's the Rambam's opinion as well. That the requirement to protect one's health is so fundamental that it's not a specific mitzvah, it's a prerequisite to the entirety of Torah, to the entirety of Judaism, to the entirety of any being practiced. That's why the opinion that Dr. Abraham quotes from Shlom Zalorach is more difficult for me to understand, because of the fact that it's so fundamental, that according to Rambam, it's not even a mitzvah. It's, it's uh, so absolute, it's like emunah and Hashem to take care of oneself. just wanted to share that. Maybe it's a miyashay and a matzvah. The, the color record count, what's the consist, what are the numbers, what are the statistics of people who are not diagnosed at the age of 45? The specific uh, 45, or at least 50, 50, let's say, whatever the specific recommendations are. Uh, but uh, colorectal cancer is a colorectal cancer is a very common cancer, and it's a very, very uh, you know, uh, uh, aggressive cancer if it's not caught early enough. Factor of the Hay unit. Also, a quick important story. I can ask Rabbi Yisrael Khan if he could briefly say a minute or two a certain interesting story that happened recently, which is a kid that is with the police. After Rabbi Khan's story, we'll segue into the, the, the inspector. Rabbi Khan, please. So I can take a picture. Okay. Weeks ago, there was a tragedy that happened in New York City. A highway patrolman, patrolman, Aramant, Saint Aramant, uh, was on the way to his job and riding a motorcycle, he washed out or hit something and tragically passed away. Um, there was a stupid comment that someone put on social media, basically saying, if you got a ticket and highway patrol, check the name, this may be a lucky day, and then signed off saying, Lili Nishma Sadiq. Now this pious person, Lili Nishma Sadiq, but Moshe. Now, back in the day when Jews were persecuted in, in Europe, there was a saint, the rabbi, who has since passed, and he would help people out. You know, they would go to him, he was a mystical person. Someone in a very bad light went and connected these two together, and just, it was horrible. Worse than that, someone put it on an Instagram account with over 12,000 viewers. There were people who said, this is disgusting, remove it. But for the most part, people are busy, didn't see it, didn't take the time to respond. Myself, as a police liaison in Rockland County, felt horrified by this, reached out to a couple of friends there in Brooklyn and in the city, and decided we want to do a fundraiser, just to show that this is not who we are, this is not what we present. Within 24 hours, over $11,000 was raised. In addition, toys free, and that's all donations, 20, 30, $5, $1, from Jerusalem with love, condolences, I never got a ticket. One person even said, I think I may have received a ticket from you. Just people showing who we really are that we respect law enforcement. As I was say to say, if not for the, pray for the uh, for okay. justice, because if not for that, one would swallow each other, they would attack each other. In addition, Toys For You, um, and this is news, nobody's aware of that yet, Toys For You, a Jewish chain store, in New York has graciously donated a thousand dollar gift certificate for the children of the family so they can have a little success. We will be presenting it at a time, uh, the time to be the, the, uh, you know, decided by the police department, but you know, as a shlich of the Igid, I'm the spokesman and I uh, just wanted to... Uh, you know,
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, so again, I, I appreciate being here, <clears throat> reading all the information that you guys have here. It seems like it's like a health bit of a seminar. I did not hear the last presenter, but I heard the presenter before that, and he scared me out in the hallway, <laughs> talking about heart disease and cardio, this and that. I'm sitting between him speaking about cardio issues, and in the conference room across the hall, they had a uh, conference about um, gastric bypass surgery. <laughs> so I think I already brought me here for some sort of intervention. If you want me to sit down, you tell me about the, the, my, my ill diet. I gave, I gave you a hint. So I, I think so. I don't I know. So. You need a cardiologist. I, I, I have a cardiologist, actually. He says I'm okay. So again, I do uh, appreciate being here, and now I do apologize, but the tie's got to get loose in the jacket. He's got to go. As Ari and uh, Mandy know, I've been working since 8.30 this morning. We were at a press conference in Staten Island over a hate crime there. So, again, I apologize. Uh, I'm the commanding officer of the NYPD's Hate Crime Task Force. Very quickly about me, not to eat up my time. I have 24 years in the department. I have a little over two years in hate crimes. Before that, I did five years in Special Victims Division, which was the overhead command of hate crimes doing sex abuse and child abuse work citywide with that, so that's why they found me to be the fit to move to hate crimes. Um, I can talk about numbers. I have all my numbers with me. Please, if you have any questions, jump right in. I would, I would rather a conversation than just listen to me speak. Um, I can do the numbers, but you all read the newspaper, right? Are hate crimes up? Yes, yes. they are. We know that. Are hate crimes against the Jewish community up? Oh, yes, they are. We know that. A large majority, I think last year, uh, well, a majority, last year about 52 to 54 percent of all hate crimes in the city were against Jewish people. If you break it down to the fact that there are 10 different protected identity groups in the law, the fact that one identity group, one portion of one identity group, the religious identity group, compromised up 52 percent of it, that's a large piece. If you look at all my cases this year against uh, the Jewish community, about 80 percent of them involve the drawing of a swastika. Now, earlier today, I didn't speak at the press conference I was at uh, with them earlier, but one rabbi spoke about, thankfully, it's only graffiti. Thankfully, it's only criminal mischief. The incident in Staten Island, somebody spray painted. Rabbi Katzman. Uh, I'm sorry? Rabbi, rabbi Katzman. Katzman. I don't know if he's the one who said it, but uh, it was Rabbi Katzman's uh, facility, I guess. Somebody spray painted uh, Synagogue of Satan SOS. on the wall, <laughs> and they wrote SOS on another wall. Um, but he said, thank God it's only criminal mischief. Thank God it's only property damage. When I got into this unit a little over two years ago, that's the first presentation I gave, I said, we don't use the word only in the hate crime task force. There's no such thing as only criminal mischief. That to me is no better than an assault, a robbery, a major incident. It's, they're all the same. Hate crimes are hate crimes. So just to tell you a little about what we do. Um, it's a citywide unit. We turn out to the Lower East Side of the 7th Precinct. There's 25 people in the unit, including myself. I have right now about 19 investigators because I picked up two more yesterday. Uh, people say that's not enough. 19 investigators in a city of 8.6 million people, 368 crimes last year, that's not enough. If you break down that math, my detectives are handling about one and a half cases a month. If you're dealing with a precinct detective squad because a robbery, a car broken into, or any other issue like that, you're dealing with a detective who handles probably 200 cases a year. Mine handled 20. Because of that, these guys are focused on exactly what they're doing. They have plenty of time to work that case to completion. <coughs> a little about the Hate Crime Task Force. December 31st of next year will be the 40th anniversary of the creation of a hate crime unit in New York City. It used to be called the Bias Incident Investigation Unit when it started. Sometime in the late 90s, it switched over to called the hate crime unit. We are the largest dedicated hate crime unit in the world, in the country. And we are the second oldest, because no matter how good the Yankees are doing right now, <laughs> Boston still beat us to get the first hate crime unit. They had the first one before us, but we're still the largest. There are 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country. 18,000. <coughs> Somewhere between six and eight of them, roundabout, have dedicated hate crime units. Six or eight out of 18,000 have a unit that just does hate crimes. Everybody investigates hate crimes, every municipality does it, but it's lumped in with elder crime, or special victims, or some sort of major case unit. Ours are just the investigation of hate crimes. As I said, we work citywide. We have all five boroughs. We are responsible only for hate crimes. We work with 
almost too many people to mention who work with federal partners, the Department of Justice and the FBI. Work with state partners, the New York State Police, occasionally New Jersey State Police. Uh, we work with our city partners, um, mayor's office, city council, Commission for Human Rights. I don't want to leave anybody out. NYPD units. Of course, the whole gamut of NYPD units are at our beck and call anything we need. Uh, people sometimes ask about our outreach. Sadly for you, our outreach is me. We are investigators. I run an investigative unit. Their job is, after incident, go out and investigate a case. Sir? Is there a profile of the average perpetrator? Is there Ooh. <laughs> You're jumping into the end of my presentation early. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Um, I'll make me lose my train of thought of what I was talking about, but <coughs> average perpetrator, ages 13 to 65, uh, probably looking at the bell curve, you're probably talking 20 to 35 is the hump of the bell curve. Uh, I started breaking it down recently because we never really focused on that until the past few months. What we, very roughly, 50% African American. 25% white, 25% Hispanic. That is the rough, look at the last three years' experiences, that's roughly where we are right now. I don't know where you were going with that, I think that's the information you wanted, but I'm going to segue into what everybody else thinks. Extremist groups and white supremacy. Are extremist groups and white supremacy rising in this country? Yes. Absolutely. Are there extremist groups and white supremacy movements in this city? Absolutely. In my two years plus there, in my five years previous experience working with them, I have one case right now dealing with an extremist group. Actually, in my seven years, two cases dealing with an extremist group. Two. Our perpetrators, we cannot link anything to extremism or any kind of identity movement. These are usually 360 random individuals committing 360 random acts. They may do duplicate incidents, they may have patterns, they may put swastikas uh, on various locations, so they've done more than one each, but we don't connect them to an extremist movement. Is that consistent with national statistics, do you know? I don't believe it is, no. From what I see, a lot of the publications put out by the ADL, no. I, we've seen, you see what's going on in the country, you see Pittsburgh, you see California, you see all these places, they're part of extremist movements. You look at uh, Dylan Roof in uh, South Carolina, we went into the African American church and uh, murdered eight people. You look at those places, there are definitely more active, organized hate groups doing activity in those places. I mean, luckily it's not here. I say luckily it's not here, but sometimes I wish it was one group doing 360 crimes. This city has done an excellent job of stamping out drug crews and violent shooting gangs. And unless they lump them together and they eliminate that entire group, you see takedowns every day of 20, 30 people in a takedown. I would love to do that. I can't. It's 360 random individuals. I can't just lump together and, and lock up the whole group, unfortunately. What about monitoring social media? They said uh, that the uh, someone noticed the um, highway shooter post something. Was it five minutes they, before they notified uh, law enforcement? It is, social media is a very rough gamut. It's such a vast, dark web. Uh, our intelligence division does that monitoring. Um, I, do, I do work with the Anti-Defamation League, and I actually do a presentation on Thursday with their extremist expert. Uh, it's like the EDL are good because they don't have the laws that we have restricting what we can do and what we can't do. We can't monitor certain things without a reason to do it. Private organizations can do whatever they want. Nonprofits can do whatever they want. And we are in contact with groups like that. Um, hate speech is not a good enough reason to monitor? Well, we don't. Not by us. Um, hate speech is a reason for our intelligence division to monitor. I don't work with them enough. If they get something, they contact me. For example, somebody from World Jewish Congress, uh, Betty Ehrenberg, so she's right. she emailed me that uh, they found something. I think the guy's in Michigan, and he put up uh, a, a rant. She notified me about it. I notified Intel about it. Intel went to the FBI, and the FBI said, yep, our Detroit field office is following him right. Wow. Thank you. That's great. That's all I wanted to hear. Somebody's watching it. But a lot of these social media sites and internet sites, they have search algorithms that look for words. Well, what are the words? What did the Pittsburgh shooter put on social media before he went into the synagogue? Do you remember his words? 
I'm going in. That was his post. I'm going in. No search engine is going to capture that and know what it means. If he said, I hate Jews, something would have caught it. If he said, I'm going to kill blank, something would have caught it. When you just post something like, I'm going in, it's very hard to trace. What we need then is somebody who sees it to report it, and that usually works, and our Intel division lead desk gets all those cases. How long does it take to act on it? If something's solid enough, someone calls you, how long to, oh my God, like, you know. Uh, Depending on the severity of it, I mean, if yeah. somebody says, I'm if you feel like shooting up Lennox right Hill right on, uh, on Tuesday, yeah, I just well, it's going to be acting on faster. But if it's hate speech that's going on, I, I can't give you an estimate on how fast leads is going to take a case on it. Is anti-Israel hate speech also considered anti-Semitic? Mm, that gets rough, and then I'll segue into something else to explain that to you. Anti-Israel hate speech and anti-Semitic hate speech is legal. I don't have to like it, nor do you, but it is legal. It's protected by the Constitution. I could stand up here right now and talk about, I'm Italian and Polish, so I'll use me. I'll talk about how the Italians and the Polish people shouldn't be cross-breeding, they're the uh, scourge of society, they've ruined New York City. I could do this for hours. And I could just ranting, I could use any obscenities I want, talking about what horrible people the Italian and Polish are. And I could do that all day long. And it's completely legal. Hate speech is legal, it's protected by the First Amendment. Acting on hate speech, and acting includes threatening on, acting on hate speech is where it goes into criminality. You need a true threat. You Italian Polish guy, I'm going to kick your butt. Now you've crossed the line. Now you've crossed the line into an actual hate crime, aggravated harassment here in New York City. I don't know what other jurisdictions do. Well, in New York State, it's the New York State Penal Law. But the hate speech part is a problem because it's. If you follow, again, I keep referencing the ADL, they do a lot of work in collecting the information that they feed out to, to all of us. They report hate incidents. You'll see they don't use the word, no. they don't use the word hate crimes. Because they're hate incidents. That protected free speech is a hate incident. It's not nice. So they should report that it's anti-Semitic, it's anti-whatever they're preaching against, but it's not handled as a crime. Do you want to okay. This is uh, Dermot Shea. I was able to enable, uh, I was able to start up a Twitter page. So I always look at it to make sure. At NYPD Hate Crimes, with an S. At <coughs> NYPD Hate Crimes, you can follow that. Uh, CNN did an article on the Hate Crime Task Force. They published it on Sunday. I tweeted it out today. So, <coughs> lovely interview with me at my desk. And also we made an apprehension in Lower Manhattan today on a anti-Hispanic hate crime of a woman who threw a chair at a guy's face and hit him in the forehead after yelling some uh, terrible anti-Hispanic slurs. Stuff like that gets tweeted out. So follow, if you're on Twitter, follow me, I'll follow you back. Uh, it's not a reporting mechanism, so don't report hate crimes through there. Report through 911, always, always call 911. The Twitter police aren't coming to investigate your crime. Take a picture and put it on Twitter and say how horrible this is. The Twitter police are not showing up, neither are the fake book agents. Call the police, call 911, and somebody asked me to mention, Site security. I know that was one of the original topics you guys mentioned. All I'll touch on is cameras. If you have cameras on your business, on your residence, on your synagogue, on wherever, make sure they work. Make sure they're recording. Make sure they point in the right direction. Make sure people know how to use it and access it. And make sure the time and date are correct. If you're off by an hour and 27 minutes, it takes me that much longer to look for my crime evidence, because i got to try to figure out where it is. Make sure everything's accurate. Make sure somebody knows how to use it. When I show up and I ring your doorbell, say, yep, absolutely, I know the code, let's go in. Boom, let's do it. Not, I've got to call my tech, he'll be here in three days. So those are the things I ask you with camera security. Is there anything else? I, don't, yeah. you don't want to... I, I just scan, and the first point of contact is going to be on the CAT scan table. Wow. As you guys know, for every second that goes by that we don't treat a stroke, we lose brain cells. You have a, okay. The hospitals, ambulances have a stroke ambulances. There are stroke ambulances in the city. Um, there are very few of them, but they're not operated by Northwell Health mm -hmm. at this point. The cost benefit is still being worked out mm -hmm. in terms of research. Um, so this is our resuscitation room. Mm -hmm. No, they don't have no, no, no. Just Cornell, as far as I know. Let me those things fast. You don't have to have it. Exactly. 
So we have two bays here, obviously. Um, it's equipped with any equipment that you would need to resuscitate any sort of condition that comes into this emergency room. Trauma. Even though we're not a trauma center, we do see trauma walk-in, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, people that are actually lifted off of the subway tracks, people that are picked up off of the streets. It's very sad and unfortunate, but we're able to manage those patients here. Um, so this is two resuscitation bays. We have all the equipment, uh, airway equipment, resuscitation equipment. We can warm fluids for patients who come in hypothermic. Their temperatures are very low. Mm -hmm. We warm it up, we put it inside their veins, and then we're able to increase their body temperature very quickly. Very important in the winter. Yes, absolutely. So we do have um, actually a lot of defibrillators across here and here. If somebody's heart stops beating and it's a shockable rhythm, we're able to give them a, an electric shock. Mm -hmm. So this is really where the sickest of the sick patients come into our patients. No, that I know, that I know. And we can come. They can, yes. So it's a great question, yes. And sometimes it's a case-to-case -case basis. They may review the case and say, look, we have a spot open with our advanced technology down here at Meath. Why don't you just send the patient down there? It's just not too And far. is there an ambulance available? We could do an ambulance, transport? or alternatively, if it's very low acuity and it's not so emergent that the patient can walk and looks well, they can actually just take a taxi over there. Yes, exactly. That's a great question. But this is where a lot of our consultants, plastic surgeons, will come in. Optim uh, ophthalmologists, as we mentioned, and ear, nose, and throat doctors, otolaryngologists, to come in and do procedures that we may not be able to handle or that maybe a patient requests themselves. Plastic surgeon, for example. I want to thank Mr. Leggio, administration, and staff, including Rabbi Silverman and Kate of Lenox Hill Hospital for hosting and participating in this amazing symposium. The presenters, Dr. Mandel, Dr. Rosenbluth, Ms. Hartog, and Rabbi Dr. Weiss, were very informative and truly gave us all much information, encouragement, and insight to living a healthier life in which, in turn, will help us all in the holy work we do for those we care about. I want to thank everyone for attending this symposium and, and truly hope you found it to be a meaningful event. And the program is the contact information to reach Rabbi Weiss for additional halacha questions you may have. Rabbi Silverman about Lennox Hospital. Rabbi Hammer about the National Council of Young Israel and myself about the Rabbinical Alliance of America Igna Rabbanim. Certificates, handouts, and other material is available. If you didn't get it, we'll give it to you. Don't forget to turn back your cell phones. Thank you again and have a very good evening.